Mr. McKenzie, oh, I like that suit, I have to say. <laughs> How's it going, man? It's going great. Can you see me? Yeah, I got you. I had to match the, uh, I mean, it's a kill streak. Yeah, right, I know. So. I like that. I like that. You know, I was mentioning <laughs> during your testimony there that uh, you had a much better suit on than the uh, baldy there that was uh, questioning yeah. you. Uh, <laughs> they, they're government fools. They don't know anything about how to dress or look good, though. They really don't, a- man. God. He was okay, actually. He was nice. I thought he was going to be a lot more vicious. Like I, I was prepared for everything. You know, I was waiting for the whole, you know, mind comp interrogation. And they just uh, <laughs> no, they didn't really. They were a lot meaner terrible. about me when I wasn't there. Leading up in the days prior, they were making all kinds of remarks, and then I sat down, and they just for some reason lost their enthusiasm. They lost their nerve. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't really as as nasty as it could be. But I, I have to laugh every time they go through the diagonal thing. Now you kind of went through it already uh, in the testimony, but they they talk yeah. about it like it's uh, you know the stormtroopers or some shit. Um, I guess what, what are the operations of diagonal like now? Uh, I guess I'll ask you. <laughs> this- the same, you know, actually a little bit, uh, uh, pretty expanded, actually. There's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, little kind of regional, basically just friend groups or cliques, so like all over the country, like in different areas, like in southern Ontario, there's a big one. In BC, there's a big one. Alberta's got a big one. So like, uh, yeah, wherever, wherever they're kind of congregating, and some of them are smaller, 5, 10 guys, and other places it's up to 40 and stuff. So, um, yeah, it's just that it's people had to find each other and, and find people that uh, – find a, a tribe to belong to, you know, they need, they, everybody deserves that. They need to have a peer group and a kinship. They deserve to belong somewhere and, and nowhere else was, was having us. We were all unacceptable and, and garbage and killing grandmothers and, you know, terrorists and all this kind of stuff. So we just kind of created our own little party tent out in the woods and they wouldn't let us have that either. That was apparently too scary. So they really don't like white guys getting together. That really freaks them out. I've noticed that. I've noticed yeah. that. That gets, them, that gets them a little shaky. Uh, I've noticed that. We went through the hate gate thing here. Yeah. But before we hit that specifically, uh, give a little bit of your background and how you just become basically a target uh, of the Canadian government and why do you think that's happened? Yeah. Sure. Well, it's not hard to do if anybody wants to try it. It's, it's really easy. <laughs> you just open your mouth and they'll, they freak out. They're very weak people. Uh, I was in the military for uh, 14 and a half years, is roughly. Sometimes I say 15, sometimes I say 14. I'm not entirely sure. I have to do the math you know, month to month, but sure. for, a good, for a good stretch. I got some photos and stuff back there. But yeah, 14 and a half years, uh, more or less. And, and I got out and, and spent about uh, two years just drinking. You know, as most guys end up doing, and a lot of them never escape that that spiral. You go to you know FOB, a Ford operating base living room couch, and check in with your new officer, Captain Morgan, every other day, and <laughs> he'll he'll give you your new orders, which is you know playing video games and eating pizza and just waiting to die, more or less. And I've always been a pretty uh, passionate guy about certain things. When I was in the military, it was a lot of the same rants and kind of blah, stupid things we would do there. But I care about the things I care about you know, pretty deeply. And I've always cared about the country and, and I'm a nationalist. I've always, always been that way instinctively. That's why I wanted to be in the military. And it wasn't because I thought guns were cool. I thought the concept of, you know, a bunch of guys that would, you know, like my grandfather and, and my father and all these other, these great men I grew up around that I always felt safe and comforted as a kid, because I always knew that if anything ever bad, anything bad ever happened, they would, they would take care of it. And, uh, you know, you'd go down to the Remembrance Day ceremonies once a year and you'd see these awesome guys with their medals on and they're just like the things they had to do just to like on our behalf. I thought that was just, you know, since that was an amazing thing, I could, I could hope to even fill a quarter of their shoes. I would love to try. Um, so that's that kind of drew me to that. And, and then I got out of the army and, and the home that I left behind has been turned into something else and it's more or less gone now and uh, really only survives in the basically the hearts and the minds of you know our people that are you know trying their best to tread water and stay alive and play this game of musical chairs of homelessness or you know um, unemployment that's happening in Canada right now so I started you know making videos and I was just trying to be funny I I, I wanted to go into comedy that was the plan uh, it's I've got a political slant on a lot of things that I joke and laugh about. This just because that's, that's who I am, and I'm not. Wouldn't be the first one to do this. Lots of other comedians in the past have you know sure. heavily in their act. Like Carlin was a guy like that towards the end, and so on. Who's somebody I really admired, for the most part. <laughs> Some things he <laughs> believed I'm not a fan of, but you know. Uh, so I tried to. I was making silly YouTube. I'm beheading Barbies because I was like a Christian ISIS guy. Like I was doing all kinds of wild, you know, funny stuff. I thought it was fun, and uh, that was fine. And then I went and did a protest action. Um, they had a basically a guy that was a part of the Taliban. They called he was a, he was a child soldier, even though we were the same age. He and I, and uh, he was held in Gitmo for a while for killing uh, several American soldiers with a grenade, or at least one. He grievously wounded a few others, and uh, they gave him ten and a half million dollars, and then they paraded him around the country like a hero. And this happened to be you know taking place ten minutes from my house after I was already 
talking about this for weeks and I find this out. So I felt like I was being called by the universe. You know, this was like God egging me on, you know, like, oh, you got a big mouth. Here he is. What are you going to do about it? I felt I, I would be a fraud if I didn't do something. So it's like, I'm going to put my medals on. And I'm going to walk right down there and just give it to them. And I did. And uh, nobody would cover it. No media touched me. Gavin McGinnis did. He was the only person that asked to speak to me. Uh, at the video that was shot there by a friend of mine, Peter McIsaac, uh, who I met there that evening, ended up getting like six or seven million views in a day or two. I woke up. I went home and probably put 14 beers away. <laughs> and then uh, woke up. You know, uh, My friend Derek is calling me. He's like, oh, you got to wake up now. People are trying to get you on, on the show. I was like, oh, shit. I had a 1,000 subscriber YouTube channel at this point, right? Like I was like, nobody. I don't have any influence at all. I was just screwing around. And uh, went talk to him, but I had thousands of messages from my biggest fear was always not what people would think or like, I don't give a shit, but I don't want to let the boys down. I don't want to make them feel like, you know, they have to <laughs> explain or like, oh, yeah, I don't really know that guy. You know what I mean? I, I didn't yeah. want that. That would, would have hurt the most. And I had thousands of messages from most of them I never met, guys from all over the country, girls too, and their spouses or the families of guys that have been killed, thanking me for saying what they wish they could say. And I knew right then, I was like, They're, the news is never going to publish this. No one's ever going to, they don't care if they believe me or not. I know what's true. I sat there and I answered every single one of them. It took me weeks to get through them all. And I knew at that point something was really wrong and I was on to something and I knew that people weren't happy with the way this place was going. So pretty much from then on, and then the anti-hate stuff started within a day. Within 24 hours, they had a preloaded hit piece of like out of context clips and quotes and stuff going back months from, from other channels I was on with like, you know, there's 40 people watching it and stuff. And some of them apparently were communists recording everything. And uh, who does that? You know, I'm, I'm a guy with a tiny YouTube channel and they went to this effort and they had this pre-holstered ready to go. Why? Just in case, apparently. Yeah. And that was the beginnings of the anti-hate network. And we've been kind of in this back and forth struggle ever since until I decapitated them uh, earlier this year. And their CEO, their, their chairman, Bernie Farber, had to step down because he's spending time with his family. Yeah. No, it was revealed that they're imbe imbeciles. They've been so thoroughly discredited. They've lost several court cases. They've been found guilty of slander and defamation and all these things. So. Um, they lost badly. They're still trying to peddle around their nonsense. No one takes them seriously, but they're basically the Canadian ADL. So that's kind of what we've been doing. And then, then since then, uh, they've, you know, come down. I became a person of interest in the spring of 2020 or 20. Yeah. 2020. Cause there was a mass shooting in Canada. It was the worst one we've ever had. Um, I wouldn't even call it a mass shooting. The guy went on a rampage for reasons unknown because the police aren't really forthcoming with the answers, even though he had a police car, a police uniform, and police weapons, and connections to the police department through his family, and so on and so on and so on. And he's a paid informant and all this kind of stuff. Dozens of people are killed and murdered. Evidence destroyed. No one knows what happened. So I put a video out basically calling out the RCMP. Like, what do you, like, I'm not, maybe you think everyone's stupid, but I know how these operations are supposed to work. You didn't do even the basics. You didn't even cordon off the county. You didn't even close the highway. You didn't even try to stop this guy. What are you doing? What's going on here? Then I become a person of interest, and I'm being looked into by the RCMP. I find this out much later down the road through sure. legal disclosure for all the courses, for the cases and stuff, right? But unbeknownst to me at the time, they decided to start looking into me. The Saskatoon police, which is where I was living at the time, it's a city in Western Canada in Saskatchewan, were looking into me for like, what they want my 15-year history back to 2005, like right out of high school. They want to know everything, who I'm talking to, like what? What is this? And then the York Regional Police, which is outside Toronto, a place I've never lived, have an organized crime unit who is dedicated to me and my friends and so on. And they're talking to the RCMP all around the country. So there's multi-agency <laughs> cooperation, uh, you know, because I, what, I hurt your feelings? That's essentially where this began. And conveniently for the police, because they didn't like their feelings being hurt, they have this astroturf narrative from the anti-hate people to go, oh, look, see, got them now. Copy, paste, let's go get the, let's go get the terrorist. And they charged me with all kinds of things. I had five different criminal cases in three provinces for uh, assault, for harassment, for uh, weapons charges, and all, all kinds of things. Uh, I've beaten four of those cases now. I was charged 23 times. Canada has an average conviction rate of 50 to 64%, depending on who you ask. I've beaten all of them. I'm 19 and 0. I've got four left, and they're not going to survive much long either, because that case is the weakest of all. That's the most ludicrous of all of them. They would raid my house and they took all of my guns, which were all legal. They're all registered. You know, I'm a veteran. I'm no criminal record. I'm a firearms professional. Everything's locked up as it's supposed to be. And they said, no, no, these are all, these are all machine guns. <laughs> these are all illegal machine guns and all this, which of course they could play in the media for with this case was just resolved last week. It took two, over two years. So for two years, they can say all these things about me. People believe it and uh, they never make a correction. So your, your reputation is forever tainted. And that's uh, one of their, one of the main weapons of these people. 
well, that's kind of where print, we're at now. They don't print the retraction, right? They, they don't print the news story. It's A1 uh, when it's, when it's mach- oh, he's charged with machine guns, illegal, you know, this and that. Uh, then it, you know, quietly gets dismissed and they don't ever talk about it, right? Uh, and so the people who don't aren't plugged in just keep that in their right. minds. And I've seen that in the U.S. and elsewhere. It's a common tactic, uh, like yeah. you said. Now, before we get into the to the Haygate stuff and some more specific questions, um, why do you think, and obviously uh, there's a lot of your people here, uh, in the kill stream chat uh, here live representing that's right yeah. uh, <laughs> diagonal there in the chat um, yeah. you've obviously resonated uh, in a way that I don't see too often uh, you know you do see it but uh, a lot of devotion uh, to you and your message and just you personally though um, why do you think that is I've wondered that, you know, I certainly don't feel like I deserve it. I'm not one of these guys. Uh, trust me. I, I feel like a, you ever hear the thing imposter syndrome. I talked about this yeah. with uh, my girlfriend Morgan lots of times. I, you know, we all go through that. If you're, if you have a soul, I think if you're a normal, decent, humble person, like why, you know, it's crazy, but, but at the same time you have to use your brain and think about it. And, and who, if I'm, if I'm them, if I'm somebody just desperate to, for somebody to say something resembling sense and sanity, because there's no one anywhere and no one's sticking up for me and my family and my kids and my dad and my mom, and we're all just getting punished and crushed and suffocated under the lunacy of this place. And you see somebody that's sticking up for you and refuses to say no and is willing to go to jail and willing to take and just keeps coming back and swinging away. It's hard not to like somebody like that, I think. And, um, I've had people in my life like that that I've looked up to and admired and, and supported for for similar reasons. So I can I can I understand it and but at the same time it's a it's a it's a big responsibility. And I was kind of I don't want to say playing loose with it, but but a little bit. In the, especially the early years. I was just kind of having fun. I didn't set out to do this. I wasn't trying to be anybody's, you know, uh, you know, follow the leader or something. I was just trying to have a good time and make people laugh and help help them a little bit. And um, but you know, it's kind of evolved in, into something and, and they're now they're throwing me in jail and they're, they're, you know, stalking my family and they're doing crazy stuff. So I said, Oh, okay. You want to play? Let's play then. So I went to jail and I just started, I went back to working out every day and I haven't, I haven't been drunk in two years. I don't do anything, any of that anymore. I'm just full all business all the time now. I mean, I like to laugh and have a good time sure. and on my show. It's supposed to be entertaining, but uh, yeah, there's just no time for that because I can't get caught with my pants down. I can't, I don't have, I literally can't afford, to, I don't have time to go out and get hammered and sleep all day. And, you know, I don't know who's watching. Everybody's, you get these freaks out here gunning for you all the time. You can't really take any time off. It's just, uh, it's part of the gig. You're going to take it seriously or not. So I just decided that I would. And, and, uh, we've been making some inroads with some, some, uh, some ideas here and, uh, there's no, there's no real faction or organization or anything uh, that that represents our interests uh, in Canada, especially if you're like the the white working class regular guy that you know the old old style Canadian. There's just there's nothing. Everybody's against us. Every political party, all the media, everything. So um, we'll, we're going to try and fill that void, uh, much in the line of you know many other sister you know or parallel organizations you could you could say. And in other countries, you've got like. Uh, Colette's patriotic alternative in the UK. You've got Thomas Russo's Patriot Front in the States. You've got guys like this all over the country or all over the world, rather, um, reacting to, as reactionaries, the same uh, situation that we're facing here. And there's just no one's doing it. So it's not that I necessarily want to or seek this out, but it's um, it's like being snowed in and you got to get out. You got to get gone, gone somewhere. And it's just you and your, you know, sick wife and your kids. Like, do you expect them to shovel the? Like, you're the only one that seems to be able to, or wants to, or has the ability to. So it kind of falls on you to to do it. At least say something, or at least put something forward. And I, I'd, I'd feel, um, I'd feel guilty and and ashamed knowing that I I could I could make a run at something. And uh, I didn't because I was just afraid or I was intimidated by it or I was comfortable where I'm at. I don't want to take any, any more additional risk and so on and, and watch everything degrade and fall apart. And then, you know, I'm a 50-year-old man going, I wonder what would have happened if I was a little bit less of a bitch. You know, that, that's my biggest fear. So, you know, me and some of the guys up here, are, we're, we're, we're kicking the tires on, on, some, uh, on some stuff there as well as just the general culture war stuff and, and trying to network people and tie them together and get them healthy, which I, which is something I noticed you've been doing, which is a great job, man. I lost a hundred you know, pounds. Thank you. I appreciate you. Absolutely. That. Yeah. Dude, it's not easy to do. And it's really, it's even harder to do because if you do it, it's almost like a public admission that you were doing something <laughs> wrong in the first place. And then, yeah. you know, which, which takes some, takes some courage to do anyway. And that's, but you grow from that. And, and it also permeates through your audience. And if people look up to you and they say, well, geez, Ethan lost a hundred pounds. Maybe I could lose a hundred pounds and they try and they lose 10 and they're, and they're on their way. So you, in that way you use your, you know, your force for good you know, as, as benevolence in encountering this horrible, toxic death cloud we all live under that seems to be in everything. So, uh, yeah, we're all trying to just regenerate people and bring them back online and get them off the couch and, you know, kind of wipe away the, 
the drunken uh, brain. I mean, not literally drunken, but you know, the, 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 the fog of. I battled that myself. You mentioned, yeah, and that's yeah. another thing that I've cleaned up. Yeah. Uh, now I had a few struggles. Uh, it hasn't been a clean run, yeah. but uh, you know, working on my sobriety as well. And so when you yeah. said that, you know, you kind of get thrust into this thing, and it's like, well, you're having fun. Of course, I'm drinking on air, like whatever. Yeah. Uh, I guess at a certain point, you get a little bit older, and it's, yeah. it's people are after you in every which way, and it's like, okay. You know, yeah. you got to stop. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> What's uh, more important? Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, I, I was going to ask you, so you mentioned political um, parties. Um, have you had any, I, I know that they, first off, how long were you in jail before I get to that? Um, well, the first time I was, well, I've been arrested four times, three or four. I don't know how many times now. Um, a few times. Once was uh, four days solitary. Another time was yeah, me and my girlfriend, we were both in solitary what? for four days. Yeah. We were protesting and they didn't like that because we're not allowed to. Um, so they did, so the so and this came out in court, and if he wants to challenge it, he can fucking sue me if it's not true. But his own cops and his own private security and his guys threw him under the bus in court. The premier of Nova Scotia, so like a governor, said, uh, arrest them. Put put them in jail and charge them with something. I don't like this. Make this go away. So they did. So we spent four days in solitary confinement. We're still fighting uh, that uh, that case. That's the last one. And, uh, um, I got, I got what was the question? <laughs> so Which is how, how long did you, cause I saw you testify oh, right, right, from right. jail. So there's, yeah. yeah, that was that. And then another time, uh, so for that one, they actually, uh, came and got me from across the, I was here in, in Nova Scotia and they came, sent, uh, four or five cops from Saskatchewan, RCMP, the feds with their own plane to come and I spent six days in solitary here in Nova Scotia waiting for them to come get me on a, an, an, uh, a Canada wide warrant. So like, uh, all, all hands on deck to find this guy. Like I'm a, like I'm Pablo Escobar or a murderer. <laughs> they dragged me back to Saskatchewan and ankle chains and wrist chains and belly chains and the whole thing on a plane. We stood up, st stopped for gas like five times. <laughs> it was painful all day on this plane with these cops. And they fed me a bacon sandwich, which I thought was hilarious. And then uh, I was in the Saskatoon Correctional Center uh, jail out in Western Canada, which are, are quite a bit uh, rougher than the ones out east, I have to say. The food is terrible and the violence is much <laughs> increased. And uh, it's 98, 99% Native gangsters in, in jail, Fuck. like the indigenous uh, Native Americans. So, And on the newspapers in the jail and on the TV in the jail for about a week straight is the famous neo-Nazi <laughs> terrorist is in our jail. So as you can imagine, that played out really well. So I had some had some conflicts <laughs> there, and I was there for about, I think, 79 days or something, Fuck. 80 days. It was just a little bit shy of three months that time, and I think that was the last time. So I haven't, I've been in, out of jail since, almost two years now, so hopefully I'm done with that for at least the time. Well, I hope so, too. And, break. Uh, if you've never been, I hope you never have to go, chat, because uh, it's something yeah. to be in jail. <laughs> uh, yeah. and it's, it's worse a, than... It, it's, yeah, it's worse than the pen actually because they think, well, oh, it's just jail. It's not as bad as the, like the penitentiary. No, the pen's better in a lot of ways. Yeah, <laughs> you get your own TV. You can wear <laughs> yeah. your own clothes. You're outside. You can do whatever. Yeah. In jail, I'm, it's nothing. You basically sleep on the floor with rats. It's garbage. They feed you like uh, dishwater as soup. And they're like, just shut up and eat it, you piece of shit. And die. Everybody's killing each other. I'm eating breakfast with murderers. There's guys tattooing each other's faces over there. It's like. So what's a madhouse, dude? Well, so, yeah, some don't... people don't understand that, that actually in a, in a lot of ways prison, and I didn't know if it was like that in Canada, but it's like that in the U.S., in a lot of ways prison is better than jail because more commissary, more more freedom, yeah. you know, you might have a job there, right? You can, you can walk, go people outside are, more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People are there a long time and they yeah. know it and they don't want to make it worse, so they're kind of chill and it's just yeah. like, let's just get the time done. There's no need to screw around and yeah, so, but jails, you know, people are escaping. <laughs> like, it was crazy. One guy was let out. He had been convicted, 129 convictions. He said he had, he's proud of it, right? And he'd been in there for a year and a half already. He went out on a Thursday and he was coming, he came back in Friday night. We're out on the range lifting weights. There, There's Travis covered in mud, ripped jeans. Like, you were, you just laughed back right back in he was out for you know uh, 12 hours and he's back in jail like crazy yeah, many such place. cases <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> many such cases of that sort of thing yeah um now let me ask you about your uh like political uh, involvement or uh embraced sure. by any of these parties of course they had you uh shaking hands with uh poly polyev is it polyev or uh, i always want to say yeah. polyev, uh but that's not yeah. how you say it um it doesn't matter he's not even a man <laughs> doesn't even really matter what his name is. so well, that was a that was a work. Like that was a move, sure. which was sure. they don't even. So we're being harassed by these idiot journalists and saying all these things. And he was again in my town, right down the road. And um, previously to that, I had gone up to meet this other guy, a veteran, James Top is his name, War Officer James Top. He marched across the entirety of Canada with a rucksack on, like an animal, like the Terminator, just to make a point and, and draw awareness to these kinds of things that were going on. He was in Cape Breton, 
uh, going south through Nova Scotia, uh, down toward Ottawa. So I went up there to meet him, but also he was there. Polya was there at the same time and they're all, oh, they're all meeting in secret and they're doing all some kind of, so I had some, uh, I had someone record, uh, some talking where he was involved in the background and, and like leak this. So they're like, oh yeah, they're secretly meeting as green up buzz. And then I went down there to, to see, I was like, I just need a photo with him. I just need a photo with him. And it looks like we're friendly and shaking hands. That's it, which I got. And within minutes they take the bait and they're all, oh! and they're all, you know, freaking out. And I was like, got him. And, uh, yeah, that was just, that was just for fun. But yeah, they've, uh, that was before I was arrested. And then, um, yeah, he tried to have me arrested and charged. He called the cops on me. They, I was already in jail and these investigators come down like, you're trying to rape his wife. And I'm like, no, we saw that gross. Early. I would, yeah, I yeah. would never do that. She's gross. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to give them. So that went on. And, uh, yeah, no, I generally, I don't like any of them. Um, I did participate in, in the beginning with the people's party because uh, it was a that. yeah go it was a startup and it's like an alt alt uh, conservative party because the one we have isn't it's these are liberals and uh but that's you know it's just they're, it's going nowhere and i really didn't like um you know they kind of took advantage of us and uh our talking points and so on and we've had guys in jail i was in jail there's another one of the guys who we had to spring out of jail chris lysak um i barely knew the guy and then got to know him because he was in prison they kept saying i put him there you know, it was my, so I ended up uh, kind of eventually befriending the guy and, and, you know, I felt so bad for him. He calls me up and he's like near death. I mean, the government's just coming down on them. They got no lawyers. They got no help. So we get money to spring this guy out of here. It was like a quarter million dollars and in comes, you know, some of these people to go, Oh, look at all the horrible thing. Where were you six months ago? Where were you a year ago? It was too politically, uh, well, we don't know. We're going to see how it plays out first. You know, they're the types types of people, politicians especially. I like to use this metaphor from like medieval times when the guys are fighting with swords and shields. There'd always be, you know, brave Sir Robin who hides hides in the ditch and then comes out when it's near the end or over, sticks his blade in a dead guy. And then so he's got blood on and goes, oh, we did it, guys. Look what we, what do you mean we exactly? And they try to get up there and, you know, soak up the, yeah, I'm just not a fan. I didn't appreciate that. And some other things that went on. So I just, uh, and I don't think it's possible the way the demographics are in Canada, the way people really vote and the way things really work. They, they want to pretend like, you know, races and ethnicities don't matter and nobody sees it, but it certainly does. And it's, uh, it's upside down. Like we're outnumbered under 18. And uh, the only way for them to win politically is to pander to the minorities and the migrant invaders, which, you know, they will have either. So you'll either never win or you'll win as a compromise and you'll be forced to do all the same things they're doing anyway. Um, no one can tell the truth about anything in this country. It seems like, so I don't really, I don't personally believe there's any, any, at least on, on the foreseeable future, any political si uh, solution in this country. So I don't, I feel like, uh, it's just a, a time suck for me. I, I don't think it's worth my energy and time to really push that. I don't think it matters who's in charge. I don't think it's one way or the other elect whoever you want. You're just going to get a different flavor of poison at the end of the day. And what's better to do is focus on ourselves and, you know, building ourselves up and constructing our own, you know, networks and try to insulate ourselves from the effects of what these maniacs are doing. And uh, eventually over time, if we're successful, we've got enough uh, parallel power and cultural power and, and you know, uh, popular support that you can start to lean on these entities, these politicians, these media sources to people to start acting right. And if they don't, well, then <laughs> that's a bridge you cross when you come to it. Maybe they'll have to be made to in one way or another. But, uh, you know, that pressure has to come from somewhere. There has to be a lobbyist, a group of something, and it doesn't exist. And they get away with it because there's no one to complain to. Like, no one, you just get pockets of people and some guys with some signs. Once in a while, something like Ottawa happens, or at least the first time in Canadian history, something like that happened to, to denote that there's any dissatisfaction at all. But outside of that, there's nothing. So, um, you know, it's it's uh, just a, it's a vacuum that I think needs to be filled. So we're, we're looking to... Looking at that. So since you brought that up, also the chat on the screen is broken. I'm trying to fix that. It was going so fast. I don't know if it just melted down power chats uh, overlay or what, but I'll, I'll get that fixed or try to uh, momentarily. If you want to send in any questions, power chat, rumble rants, all that stuff uh, should still work. I'm, I'm trying to, um, it'll still work. I'm trying to make it where it'll pop up on the screen. Um, mm -hmm. But you mentioned the Ottawa um, truck pro, uh, trucker protests. Uh, what was your role in that? And uh what are your thoughts on it looking back? Of course, we watched, you know, Trudeau, and we followed it at the time, too. Uh, yeah. Invoked the Emergency Act, and I think that was found to be, um, I don't know if unconstitutional is the word, uh, in Canada, or it was inappropriate, uh, right? I think yeah. that was the it, final finding. But it, what were your thoughts? A, a judge somewhere in a federal a superior court, I think, ruled that it was improper or, you know, yeah. incorrect, like, by law, like, that would did, didn't meet the threshold for, you know, so basically, yeah, it was illegal. Um, that was, so there's, you know, lawsuits and stuff filing now that there's, now that there's like canonized, you know, rulings to the, to that effect too. So they're, they're trying to do that. But I just, uh, I saw it happening. I saw, there's always protests. There's always people trying to do this and that. And I'm not a big fan of yelling at empty buildings. You know, I don't, it's just kind of a pressure valve and 
the reason they let you do it so often is because it has no effect whatsoever and it doesn't bother them. So that's why it's allowed because it's pointless for the most part. And then, but this one was different because you could see, you know, the, the boiling point had reached it such that, uh, you know, the prime minister's on TV saying, what do we do with these people? They're taking up space. You know, should we tolerate them? What do we, maybe something's going to be done about them. Really dark rhetoric and language is coming out here and they're building camps and, and they're ejecting, um, Sitting politicians from provincial legislatures, one guy, Randy Hillier, is another uh, in Ontario, was like, uh, I have a buy order, you know, a government right off their own website to construct these COVID camps. What are these for? What are you doing? And they laughed at him and just kicked him out of the kicked him out of the building. Like it was crazy. So everyone just kind of, you know, boiled over and, and they're like, we're taking the trucks and we're going down there. And, you know, I wasn't involved in any of that, but I saw the kind of the social media videos of, of people departing like Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta. And there's hundreds of these vehicles. And there's like drone footage and I'm like, oh, this is an issue. This isn't going to be 100 or 200 people. This is going to be, they're going to jam up the whole city. There's going to be tens of thousands of people down there. So I released my own video and I was pretty enthusiastic about it and being silly as usual. And it, uh, it got some distance. It ended up being, you know, uh, just on Instagram, like 500,000 views or something. And, and I think that's why they interpreted me as some kind of figurehead or I was involved in the planning or leadership of it. Yeah. I was just watching it like anybody else and used my soapbox to go, meh. So I was like, let's just go and, and see what happens. I want to go down and, and experience it and watch what happened and comment on it and video, you know, uh, basically that. That's what we did. And we had uh, posted up in a, just outside the city limits in a, uh, a farm, a goat farm that a guy was uh, basically rent in between like rent, rentals. So it was an empty building and it's like, yeah, there's nobody living there. There's heat on, there's lights if you want to. So we're in this basically flop house and there's like 20 of us at, at times and four or five and people are coming and going throughout the weeks and we're kind of just living there. And I'm, I'm sitting in my sweatpants, bare feet, sitting on a milk crate I found as a chair <laughs> with my phone up against like a, an empty box eating cereal, watching the government being like, we got to do something about these, these terrorists. I'm like, oh, do we? You know, and the public safety minister is on TV. Like they're, they're this agile, lethal group. They're everywhere. They're well-trained and organized. I'm in my sweatpants. Like, wow, I sound badass right now. It's, it's just, it was it lunacy, but. Yeah, we just kind of watched and some, you know, watched the carnage that beat the shit out of everybody and trampled them with horses and hit them with guns and all the stuff they did and froze bank accounts. And I had one, uh, one cop, I know, uh, send me, they asked me about it in the, the POEC, like, who sent it? I was like, some guy sent it to me. Um, that uh, the, this group chat they had on WhatsApp of all these cops celebrating this. They said, oh, wasn't that awesome? That was so much fun. I love beating the shit out of all those people. And I can't wait to do it again. I can't wait till it's my turn. And they don't pay us enough for they, you know, This is the best thing I've ever had. So I put that on the internet. They didn't like that either. So it's just been this kind of back and forth. Now, what was, so I, again, we covered a lot of this live uh, at the time, but it's been a minute now. Um, and it, it, it was quite the big deal uh, in Canada and worldwide, uh, yeah. and specifically in America. And so we covered a lot of this stuff live. There were live streams from the protests, and you know we'd be sniping it and watching it live, yeah. et cetera. Um, if I recall correctly, again, I'm not Canadian, but I kept up with this this story. They were um, like debanking people uh, and yeah. stuff like that uh, who were involved in the protest. Did that happen to you? Yeah. Yeah, so, not till after I got out of jail, though. They didn't want me paying my lawyer, so they made sure to end that. And my girlfriend's account, too. They got Morgan's also, because then when mine got canceled, I was sending her my money to give my lawyer, and they so they should cancel hers also. But, uh, yeah, they got a lot of people. So they what got, was the process I don't know. of that? Like, what, what did they say when they did that? Like, or what well, was the justification? mine's a little weirder. So in Ottawa, they just said, oh, because they're basically anybody that donated, if you sent $10 to one of these gives and yeah. goes, to these truckers, they froze your bank account because you're, you know, proceeds of terrorism or something. You're being investigated, and they were frozen for like a year or more. I don't know. Um, I didn't have it because I didn't send. I didn't. I told people I was like, I don't want any money. I'm not giving anybody any money. I'm not having anything to do with money. So if you're trying to, don't look at me. I'm not that guy because I kind of had a feeling something like that was going to be a problem. So I was just not willing to get involved because I don't know. I don't know who this leadership is. I don't know anything about what's going on down there. I'm not going to lend myself and attach myself to something. You know, it's like, you know, tying yourself to a ship. Like, who's even on that boat? I have no idea. Like, Somalian pirates? I don't know. Like, I'm not doing that. So, um, mine came after when I was in jail. And they just called me out of the blue. I had just, like, the day prior been at the bank and wired my lawyer $10,000. Because you can't just e-transfer. So, I went down there. I was like, yeah, can you send them, send them all the money I got left? And I got home. And then they called. And they're like, and uh, I knew it was a problem because it was a white guy on the phone from the bank. You know, it wasn't the usual. <laughs> We're having an anti interest credit card. Would you like to buy a product? I, no, it's not. It's like, hi, this is Tom from Scotiabank. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> hi, Tom. What can I do for you? And I started recording it right away. 
And I recorded the call and he was like, yeah, we're basically closing your bank account. And I was like, why? He's like, it's just, we just, we're closing it. And you're, you know, I was like, well, what about my mortgage? He's like, well, that matures in November. And after that, you're going to have to pay the balance. So I'm like, okay, cool. And that was the end of that. They don't really give you a reason. They don't have to. People think they have, oh, you can sue them. No, you can't. You can't do anything. They actually changed the laws already a couple of years ago that they can just summarily, nope, they can decide they don't want to do business with you for whatever reason they choose. They don't have to tell you why. And uh, that's what a lot of people have suffered that in Canada too. It's not just me. It's been, I've, there's probably tens of thousands of people it's been done to here in the past two years. Now, how did they finally, and I remember it a little bit, but uh, you probably have more knowledge than I do. How did they finally end the trucker protest? Violently. <laughs> that was my recollection too. Yeah. <laughs> they, they sent the public order, they sent the riot cops in, the RCMP's professional riot squad, and they had, um, I can't prove this, but a lot of eyewitnesses would say to the effect of guys that don't speak English in um, wearing surplus uniforms, like the olive drab kind of jumpsuit riot cop uniform, no name tags, no badges, no unit identifiers, nothing. And uh, we have no idea who they are, which is illegal to do in Canada. You can't, you can't have that. You can't walk around presenting yourself as an agent of the state or a law enforcement agency, hitting people with batons and guns and doing all these things they're doing and just be whoever. So now you couldn't even file a complaint. Like, well, which officer stepped on your face, madam? I watched this, uh, uh, two friends of mine, these women downtown, I was watching both their live streams, Kristen and Monique. Uh, she was, well, one was a nurse. I think the other one was a realtor or something. Like, just, this is who's down there. Regular moms and dads and people that are trying to defend their country from these maniacs. And I'm watching them get kicked in the face, like stepped, you can see the boot come right down on the camera even. And it's like, well, I want to file a complaint against police brutality. Okay, against two. Don't know. Don't know. Cool. Right on. So that's that went on for a few hours, and I tried to warn people, and they said, "Well, you're you're spreading hate and division and fear. You're fear mongering." I'm like, "No, there's 300 cops here from the riot squad. I have it on very good authority. You know, I'm pretty sure I've seen pictures of it. Guys have gone by, and they're in the staging area. They're not here for flowers and to have a talk. They're gonna beat the shit out of you." And no one could believe it. They're like, "No, not in Canada, bro. No way, bro. That'll never happen, bro. Not here, bro." <laughs> In come the whore. And they trampled a woman with a, on a mobility scooter. And they, you know, one guy's unconscious getting dragged away. It was, it was craziness. I can't believe no one was killed. That's a, a miracle in itself. One guy, the probably the worst one I saw. And I would say you could charge this cop with, with uh, you know, maybe attempted murder. Um, something in that, in that ballpark. Magazine in, safety off, probably round in the tube. And he's got his rifle and he's barrel end down, cracking this guy in the back of the head. Round could easily get the bolts to the sure. rear and those M4 rifle platforms. If that slings forward, yeah, bullets going right through the back of your head. Oh, well, he's a cop, though, and he can do whatever he wants. And nothing was done. There was no charges, no investigation. Never the group chat messages I leaked of all these RCMP officers. Some of them senior. One guy, Kim Ayotte, he's like a, a big shot in the Ottawa police unions and stuff. He's in there like, oh, this is great. Let's beat the shit out of more people. No, nothing was ever said. But they'll hunt me around. We got to hunt this around the country to twenty million dollars because somebody in the government got scared. But your goons can go downtown and just thump uh, wounded veterans if they want to, and that's fine. And then they can laugh about it with their friends and have that aired out in public, and that's fine too. And then they gave them a thirty percent pay raise, retroactive to a certain degree. I understand. So then they bribed these cops on top of everything else, and then they walk right right now. Actually, I should mention the guys in Newfoundland. I'm with them now. The, the fishermen there are being told that they're not allowed to sell their fish and their crabs and stuff out of out of profit. They can only sell to who the government says they can, and they're you know vastly undervalued because of the market restrictions that they're under. And they've been protesting for a while. And the government's like, well, we're done with the protesting. So the police showed up last night and beat the shit out of those guys and trampled them with horses and everything. And I understand somebody has a broken hip now. So this is the country we're in now. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't want to be right about this. I've kind of been saying this for the last few years. And it's where I began. Like, that's what the dissident word means. You know, I'm not a fan of this. And I think it's going to a dark place. Lots of people said I was crazy and you're over-exaggerating and you're just being hysterical. And now we live in a world where this is happening. Who was wrong? Now, how much responsibility do you think Trudeau himself has for this? Uh, you know, he's been prime minister for a while now. Um do you yeah. think it's it's a lot of his personal responsibility, or is it just the state itself has been drifting uh, that way, and the demographics, et cetera? If it was just Canada, I would I would say, yeah, of course it's him, but it's not. It's happening everywhere. The Democrats in the U.S. are operating operating on the exact same playbook. So are the so are the people in the United Kingdom. So are they in Australia and in Spain and in Germany and in, so this is an international kind of agenda that's being played out. He's just a he's an enthusiastic player on the team. You know, it's like blaming blaming the failures of a of a football team or or a, or a baseball team on like starting pitcher. 
damn, it's all that guy. He's like, well, or even the general, even the, even the, the manager, or is it the yeah. owner? You know, there's other layers to this of people you don't see. We can get new pitchers all day long, and we still got whatever team we want to put on the field. The game is still going to go on. Uh, the real big decisions are not happening on the field. They're happening in the back-end offices. And that's really the, what's, what's frustrating because that's the guy you see every day. You see the prime minister, you see the president, and people want to take out their frustrations on them. You don't even see the people calling the shots around here, and uh, they get away with it. And they just do these bait and switch. Well, you don't like this guy? We'll give you a new guy. And we always vote them out, my dad's always said. I would just once, I would love to vote someone in. My whole life, we've been voting people out. Get this guy out. we got to get him out. we got to get them out. we got to, no one, everyone seems oblivious to like, we're still driving in the same direction no matter who's in the driver's seat. So who's really driving the car? Because there, there's other places we can go. <laughs> I see them. I see these other roads and turnoffs and we never go there. We just keep going communism, next 10 exits, and we keep going. Uh, so, you know, I, yeah, but, but of course he's certainly not a sympathetic character, but as far as the emergencies act go, I actually was one of the first people to cut him some slack on that one, because if you're the prime minister or you're the president or you're somebody in one of these offices and they present you, you know, some, a, a presentation and you, you have like 10 minutes to make a decision because if there's, ter if you're sitting there and they're like, yeah, there's terrorists on the loose, probably we think in multiple provinces and they've got guns and they're doing this and they're doing that. So are we going to do anything about this or no? If you don't do anything and something happens, somebody gets killed, you're toast. You know, so bet the safer play is to do the crackdown and hope nothing happens. So that, that's, that was his day. But how did that happen? Who were the people that presented him this information and how, where along the chain? Because in the Hategate documents, the RCMP themselves, a senior and inspector detective, which is like, there's only uh, not very many of those in the country, says this is uh, basically nonsense. So somewhere from between him up to the public safety minister, uh, somebody decided, we're just going to lie. We're just going to make some stuff up. And, uh, Who's just hard to say who that was, but uh, basically they're all guilty. But you know, different different layers of who exactly and, and where. But I suspect the anti hate people are heavily involved. Bernie Farver, of course, is Jewish supremacist, and that whole organization has ties to CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. And the understand I understand he lives in York, where the York Regional Police Organized Crime Unit is as well. So very some interesting you know cards keep coming up in the in the deck over and over again i've seen some of those cards come up myself yeah. but, uh, <laughs> uh, but let me ask you about hey gay and it's been mentioned a couple times uh during the interview uh and we watched the, uh, a video about it before you came on a little short four minute video yeah but there's an 87 yeah, page uh document that really lays it out now i didn't get to read the whole entire document but it looks very thorough yeah. um yeah. and i linked it in chat and somebody else can link it again our again our chat overlay is just melted down uh i'll try i'm trying to get that working too but i don't know if it'll work again but we'll, we'll try to get it back uh but you can post that in the chat uh, if somebody has that link handy uh explain hate gate now you've kind of talked about it a little bit but i guess start at the top uh and and walk us through it yeah. for those who don't know about it maybe some of our yeah. american viewers sure so what happened was shortly after ottawa like it was clear like we saw all this they're on tv and you guys saw the video i was kind of listening while i was getting dressed and yeah. you know brushing my teeth and stuff and they're like, it's a, it's an organized, you know, militia, all these, all these senators are talking about this. And you're seeing they're trying to build an ethno state and all like they're reading something. I could tell, I can see that he's looking down and he's reading and he's looking down. I'm like, what are you reading? What is that? I want that paper. I want to know who wrote that and who handed that to you and where that came from. Cause this guy doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. And they're sitting there acting like they have all this with these senators that they have no fucking clue. They're just reading what's handed to them. Like no one looked into any of this. So I don't know where this came from. So shortly after this, we do a freedom of information request. And uh, one of the guys uh, puts his puts his time and money into that and spends time doing, which is you know again I, I benefit greatly from the dedication and the and the passion of the community to to help me with a lot of this stuff. They just you know because they're good people, and uh, he he got all of it, and we got a f big dump of stuff. And I want to say when was that? I don't I don't even remember now. Is it after I? It was after I was in jail, right? So yeah, maybe that spring. So I think I was out of jail and before Christmas, like December, and then it, I want to say February, March, I think, and. Um, there's a kind of a, an independent journalist character that, that documents a lot of the protest circuits and stuff in Canada. Karima Sayad is her name. Uh, she got a hold of the story and, and saw what was happening. She saw what was happening. She actually connected me with my lawyer, who is just a, a, the butcher of Canadian prosecution. <laughs> I think should be his new name. The guy's a massacre. He's just love. Great job. And uh, she she dug into this, and and uh, we handed her all the um, all the file, all the emails, all the documents, all the presentations, all the stuff that was in there. Cause we we're like, we want everything with my name on it. Anything that says diagonal any of that stuff, give it all. And they're like, well, it's going to be a lot. Like, that's fine. They sent us eventually a lot of heavy redactions too, by the way, but a lot of stuff that was not, and was quite uh, enlightening and illuminating that she used to put together this kind of expose 
and uh yeah it really lays it out and it's not just me there's other character other people they kind of did this too the same characters coming around but yeah there's it's a fabricated uh kind of um you know uh ironically like they're the anti-hate network but they they foment and create hatred around people that uh they want to destroy and that's what was done and that information was copied and pasted to the police the police copy and pasted it to themselves and they copy and pasted it to the intelligence services and they copy and pasted it to the public safety minister and he handed it to the prime minister so basically no one in canada is doing their job from top to bottom everybody's just mailing it in and not paying attention except for the handful there was a couple of officers in there besides the one that were enthusiastically being you know terrible you can see their emails in there so one, one night so i was like everybody changed their names on entropy this is just funny to me uh one of the emails in there is like a kind of detailing. It's like a line by line, like I'm under surveillance and uh, they're talking about what they're watching me do. And I'm on my show. There's a screenshot and I even, you can go back and find the episode. I was like, I bet there's somebody watching this right now and just writing down everything we're saying. They're documenting all your names. And here's their document going, Mr. McKenzie believes he is under surveillance and being watched right now. He thinks people are writing this down. Like, yes, that's literally you. You're who I'm exactly talking about. And then you have all these names. So all the guys in Entropy changed their names to these cops. Like, I'm, you know, Detective Constable Pillay now, and I'm Constable Robinson. So now they have to watch their own names on the screen. It was, That's it was pretty just good. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and they can't do anything about it. I'm sure they're watching right now, too. I saw somebody say Probably. that in chat uh, earlier. Someone is. Uh, I, yeah. I think they've. They seem to have toned it down once they've not been able to find any lucky charms, but I'm definitely, I'm sure I'm going to be on passive, you know, permanent surveillance for the rest of my life, just as, you know, uh, until we overthrow the state and install a, you know, a ruthless dictatorship. But before then, it'll all be on some kind of list or, you know, I, they won't let me have a passport even. I, I try to really? get a passport. No. Yeah, I'm not, not allowed. They say I'm on some kind of list and I have to call somebody and have to, so I may have to fight that in court now just to be allowed the privilege of leaving this, this wonderful kingdom that we have. Um, so yeah, so so she published all of that outlining this where it was no longer, I'd said this from the beginning. I said, you know, the narrative of the story is, is such and people were like, oh, the police would never, there's got to be something to it. They wouldn't be all doing this just for, it wouldn't be that stupid. Oh, well, here's the black and white documents uh, proving that that is in fact the case. And they've just been silence ever since. We've been, There's been no media published ever again. There's been nothing from the police. There's been, I just, and we just don't exist anymore. <laughs> so, because it's embarrassing and who everyone engaged in it every political party engaged in it every media part like everyone had a hand and yeah get them get these terrible now they all have egg on their face and nobody wants to say anything that's ins they don't even do that in the united states uh keep people from getting a passport um that's like next level type shit uh that's like yeah. you mentioned comedy that's i'll get they it. do in cuba but, uh right yeah. like keep you from leaving yeah. the island. I well, and because they have to justify uh, one of the things that was in the hate gate that I didn't buy, I didn't even see none of us really. I, I kind of skimmed through it, and other people were going through it. And it's, it's, I don't want to say triggering, but I've got things to do. I've got these shows to do. I've got people to care about and stuff. I don't want to sit here and read this for a day and a half and just become so blinding, blinded with rage, like hearing people talk about you, you know, in these ways and these cops and stuff. So they just kind of went through it. And one of them said, did you see this? And they sent me the link. They briefed these idiot cops, and then they congratulate themselves. This 15-minute briefing that I saw on the clip there, my buddy uh, Nathan uh, Dave of the Rake was on there commenting this. So they, this 15-minute report they did, and they all congratulate themselves on how great it was. That briefing was for the Five Eyes intelligence community. So, you know, the NSA, FBI, CIA, MI5, the Australian services, like everybody had to learn about, well, the dangers of me and the goat figurine. So I'm probably banned from most of these countries until they get an update, right? Because that's, you know, all right, put it on the list, whatever. They're busy. they got 100 things going on. So they've got me tied up in all these gun charges and, you know, this, this, and that. And they can probably justify it. But that's all over now. So if I go back in there and go, okay, make with the passport, they, what are they going to say now? Uh, I'll have to fight them, and then they're going to have to justify it, which they can't. But I'm, I'm, I will get it eventually, but I expect that we're going to be jerks about it. Now let me read. So there's a few super chats that that came in. Uh, cocaine rim job says, "Hey Gate, the best five dollars I ever spent." Full that's salute, him. Jeremy. Uh, <laughs> that was that's him. The guy you're he did it. About. Uh, yeah. Now here's a here's a guy. I think this is critical of you, uh, and I'll talk about a couple other critics uh, in a minute. A, a fat guy uh, that's a Canadian we don't like here on the show, and his cokehead partner. Fat guy. Yeah, uh, I might bring him up at one point. We'll see. He really hates you for some reason. Uh, really? Yeah. Yeah, he really hates wow. I'm not kidding, by the way. Funny. See, I don't even know who he is. All right, well, I'll, br I'll bring it up here in a bit. But comment, okay, channel, cool. comment channel says, Jeremy, what draws the line for you between organization and threats of violence? Is it face masks, guns yet to be banned, 
training at night, and then he says, call, uh, question mark, then he says, can, uh, call to arms can be interpreted as defensive, by the way, is what he said. Not in Canada. That's actually, like, that's a, that's an, so, that happened, was that in the, in the thing? I, th- I know they asked me about that at the inquiry. So those guys were cops, or they were run by cops. So what happened there was this video of these guys with the mask and the guns, they're in the woods, you know, and I first noticed, like, these are all guns they haven't banned yet. So these are all legally acquired guns. Interesting. And they've got the mask and stuff on. And they said, this is a call to arms. And that was the name of the video. And I've already, I'd already talked to some lawyers and they're, they're told me like, there's certain things you never say. That's right. one of them. That's like right out of the handbook. Never say this because jail immediately. You're, you're on, you're going down. And they're in my comment section and they're in my live stream, you know, chat being like, oh yeah, we're on the same page. We're brothers. We have to hook up and we got to do this. So I'm like, I see, I see what's going on here. I don't know who these guys are. I've never seen them before in my life. So I was, I'm pretty sure they're cops. So I call the cops immediately. I'm like, hey. Look what I found because they're already, I know they're already sniffing around me looking for exactly this. And they're trying to tie me to something. So they go, oh, oh yeah, thanks. So we'll look into that. They never called back. I never heard a thing. Nothing ever happened. And this was everything they were saying we were, that they sensationalized this in the media. Here's a bunch of guys in the woods with guns talking about violently overthrowing the country. Uh, yeah, we just don't want to put that on the news. We're just not going to talk about that ever again. It's just going to go away forever. Cool. Right on, you know, because they were cops, obviously. You know, this was some kind of move. Nobody legitimate is going to act that way. It's ridiculous. Now, uh, and again, I wasn't throwing him in with the fact that he might take a, a offense to that, uh, clearly. But, uh, yeah, he was wa- he was wanting to ask that. Uh, ZC, I- I'll say uh, in the chat, the next Super Chat says, ask Jeremy if he can get uh, Devin Larratt to his show before he arm wrestles uh, LaVon Sh- wait, Shanga. Yeah. Shagna, Sh- I Shagna Nashvili, yeah. I think is how you say that. Yeah, Devin is an old uh, uh, JTF2 operator, so he's like our Delta Force uh, level tier guys, and he's a he's one of the top arm wrestlers in the world. Um, and he's just a huge, like his hand is bigger than my head. <laughs> he's, a, he's a giant and uh, he's a legend in the army, or at least when I was in there. And, uh, yeah, he's one of the guys I, I had a lot of respect for when I was in there. He's kind of just a ghost. Like there were stories about him, you know, he's one of those characters where it was like, and, uh, I did get him on years ago. I did eventually met him in, in Ottawa and I've talked to him a few times. He's a, re- he's a really nice, really sweet guy. His family's wonderful. His wife's, you know, amazing. They're all, they're great people. And I hope he wins. You know, he actually, he took a fight with, um, who was a giant guy. Is it Eddie Hall or? One of these huge uh, freak shows in boxing, and you know, Devin at last minute the guy got hurt or something, he had to fill in. So he took it. He's just a fearless guy. He's, he's really cool. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't do a whole lot of guest stuff because it's not really that kind of show. I kind of just go crazy for a few hours. But we do have uh, me and my friends. We do we do do that kind of thing sometimes on on Sundays and some once in a while. I used to do them like kind of a daytime. You know, we'll just chill out and talk kind of thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, if you want, if you wanted to, I certainly would. Uh, I haven't heard from him in a little while, but uh, maybe I should check in on him. I think he is. He is. You know, they call it fighting. You know, arm wrestling. That guy. Yeah. Shortly, I think he's a big Russian Ukrainian guy. He's like, you know, freakishly huge. But uh, Devin's freakishly strong. <laughs> I don't know how it turned out. He, he did last time, and they he lost. But Devin doesn't like to lose, and he always pulls a rabbit out of his hat sometimes. So he he might figure it out. And, Shock the world again. I don't know. So fingers crossed for him. Chad Kroger says, get Jeremy together with Asmodor. I know Asmodor. Uh, I don't know if you, you know, know him or is. not. Uh, he's, another, no. he's another streamer. I'm, I'm looking through to make sure. I think I got uh, uh, the Super Chats there. If you have any more Super Chat questions, uh, please send them in. Now, how have you dealt with this? You, I guess you talked about this a little bit already, but um, – you know, being under the constant surveillance, constant stress, uh, you know, charges from the government, and they're looking into your you and your family and your associates yeah. and where you go and who you hang out with and, um, you know, tails on you. Who knows if your uh, communications are being monitored? I'm sure they probably are in, in certain respects, yeah. right? Um, how have you handled that um, stress just day to day? Has there been any, um, like, the tactics that you've adopted or, or like mentality that you've adopted to, yeah. to get through that. Cause it would crack most people. I would think. Yeah. A lot of people aren't going to like it though. <laughs> it sucks. It's like what your grandfather would say. It's the old school way. Um, you get used to it after a while. It is kind of, it is kind of off, off putting it for, I mean, nobody likes to be a, especially if you're not a criminal, if you're not somebody that's ever been involved in the system or, or law enforcement stuff. You're, I mean, I've known guys like that and I don't, you know, some people come up hard and I, I understand it is what it is and they get into that kind of lifestyle. But this is all new to me. It's my first time being a criminal in my, you know, mid thirties. So you're getting arrested and charged and handcuffed and they're raiding your house and stuff. I'm like, well, this is all very, this is all very, very theatrical boys i don't know if this is necessary is it but uh <laughs> yeah the way the way you defend against that is you just you just have to be the good guy 
You know, what, oh, what if they, what, everybody's paranoid. And they, all these internet, like some of them in the chat there, oh, you're some internet gangster, are you? Some anonymous fucking faggot, are you? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, nobody's, nobody cares about you. Um, if they're going to come after you, uh, why? Like, what are you doing? Well, what if the cops come? So, what are they going to, they're going to find me and my friends hanging out, talking. It's not illegal. Like, grow a set of nuts. Are you trafficking guns in your house? You shouldn't be doing that, you know? Are you doing blow? You shouldn't be doing that. Uh, if, there, if there's something for them to get you, are you evading taxes? You shouldn't be doing that. Anything they, they can find to get you, they will do. So if you go through and dot your I's and cross your T's, and you're like, I've got nothing to hide. I'm not worried about anything. If they're going to get me, they're going to have to make something up. And if they make something up, you can tear that to shreds. You're going to maybe get put through a process. It's going to be shitty. Um, but you'll win in the end. And that's exactly what they did to me, and that's exactly what happened. They tried to charge me with all this stuff. I said, this is made up. They're going to lose. They're going to have to prove all this, which they can't because it didn't happen. <laughs> as long as you don't need, you know, you don't bend and kneel and give them what they want, you go, no, no, let's go to trial. They won't let me have a trial. I've tried four times, and every time they go, you know what? We're just going to withdraw the case instead, and we're just going to say, you know, be nice for a year instead of 10 years in jail for this, you know, this, this nonsense, like as if there's ever a hope in hell they were going to get anything. I had... Um, witnesses destroyed i paid personal invest or private investigators like ten thousand dollars to track these people down and get like they're career criminals and liars and they take money to li like the people they found it's, it's preposterous and cops are planting evidence and we've got evidence of that prosecutors are hiding evidence and burying it and we've caught them doing that so i'm like i have a stack like this high of ammunition of grenades to throw at you at trial so i'm really looking forward to it and they uh yeah they didn't want to but yeah, the, the best way to defend yourself is to just, you know, don't don't uh, do anything that they can they can use against you. Don't be a criminal. Don't be a ter don't be a, don't actually be a terrorist. You know, it was kind of tongue in cheek with us, but um, you know, there's nothing cool about that. What are you going to do? You're going to blow up a bus or something, and what? You're going to kill some kid by accident? Like that's just not how we do things. It's not the upstanding. You know, that's not the old. That's not what we do. That's not who we are. That's not the kind of character we have and possess. And I don't think anybody wants to be that. Um, you know, we'll fight you out in the open face to face. I'm not going to, you know, resort to any kind of craziness. Like, but that's what they do, right? You know, I'm not, I'm not the guy that sinks the USS Liberty and you know, that's somebody else that does those kinds of things. I'm not going to act like them. I can't act like them and beat them, right? That's just not how this works. Um, but yeah, they'll come after guys and they'll do this, but Patriot Front's another great example. The United States, you know, they, uh, they they're result. coming after them. Yeah. Yeah, he's out though, and it's yeah, like, and well, yeah, his his case is also ridiculous. I think it was was because he carried a torch seven years ago. He held something that was on fire for a few minutes seven years ago, so he maybe has to go to jail for ten years. Well, that happened. Yeah, he had okay. Saul Invictus, Augustus Invictus on, and they charged him on the same the same thing. Uh, they said he yeah. was burning an object to intimidate or, or something like that, which it's a tiki torch. It's not really burning, right? right? If there's a wick that intimidate who? It. Yeah, well, that's the other thing. Yeah, that's the other thing. But yeah. a tiki torch is not actually burning, right? Like there's a wick that comes out. There's fuel that burns, right? right? You know what I mean? It's not. Yeah. It's you not can't an even actual <laughs> burning object. Yeah, right. Like yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a yeah. flame there, but it's not on. It's not like a club that's yeah. totally on fire. I don't know. It's it's just total I, bullshit but we interviewed some I, I understand the, the yeah. yeah but people get apprehensive and they get anxiety about it because they don't I mean nobody likes the idea that the state is going to come looking for that's the biggest bully in town you know when I'm worried about you know oh you're tough did you get to fight with you, got, you try fight the government fight the federal government you know they they have unlimited everything like they're and they take no prisoners at all they're ruthless um but if you're if you don't give them anything if you're doing everything by the book above board then they're going to have to start getting creative and, and greasy and sketchy now you force them to be the bad guys now they're being underhanded and dirty and deceitful and sneaky and there's risks and you're going to get caught you're going to get blown up you're going to get uh, you're going to get ruined and you know you see this uh with uh, the j6 guys right we saw everything that happened when that took place and people were saying this is a work this is set this is bullshit and all of it's coming out now right it won't last forever they can't get away with it forever it might work initially for a little while but not forever um and then so then it just comes down to it's a case of you know fear people are just afraid you're afraid to fight you're afraid to get involved because maybe it gets uncomfortable or difficult for you at some point it's like so you so what you want to do is you want to larp online anonymously and you want to hit a heavy bag you don't want to spar you don't want to get in the ring and fight anybody because you might get your nose or your ribs broken in the in, in the course of that fight you just want to hit a heavy bag and go home and be comfortable huh you know tell tell me more tell me more internet tough guy like yeah so just it is what it is. You know, if it's like, I, I want to get involved in the fight, you understand what that means then because fighting is, uh, there's risk and there's danger involved and they may try to do these kinds of things. It's just, there's no way, there's no way to make this a zero sum, you know, a zero risk game where everybody's, 
you know, comfortable and happy and everything goes your way all the time. That's kind of this childish worldview these people had. That's not the world our fathers and grandfathers grew up in when they engaged on some of the, some of the risk taking and things they had to do for us to live the lives that we had. There was no guarantee of success or victory or that they weren't going to get hurt. Very much the opposite. You could get killed just going to work. These guys are trying to put skyscrapers together with, oh, I got a rope tied to something. <laughs> Hopefully nothing goes wrong. Um, you know, in, in, from where I'm from down in, in Nova Scotia, there's a whole family's, you know, destroyed. Guys get buried alive in a coal mine. Sometimes, you know, it goes bad. It goes wrong. There's no such thing as no risk. You could get killed driving your car in the highway, man. So, you know, except I care about this and this matters to me. So if I get killed in the course of it, it's least, at least you die doing what you love. <laughs> better better than this because, you know what, I, you know, we buried a lot of guys doing that. And it was what? For what? Why? You know, Um trying to trying to fight against this kind of malevolent you know force of toxic lies these people have subscribed to in a way hopefully maybe prevents some of this in the future so in that way the pain that was caused by this can come out in a positive way through me to you know to challenge it in the future rather than just hiding so now i'll bring up i, I want to talk about polyev or polyev however you say his name polyev i think um here in a minute but uh i mentioned the the uh, hugely fat guy uh, who seems to have a hate boner for you, and I've seen him talk yeah. trash about you many times. Uh, PPP really? Is, yeah, I'm not kidding. Uh, and oh, I don't yes. really understand. Okay. PPP uh, from a show called uh, the the Kino Casino. I call it the Kosher Casino. Yeah. Uh, I know these who days, yeah. uh, because they're okay. bought off by Gabe Hoffman. Not kidding, by the way. This is not uh, freelance. Uh, and recently, um, they were spreading the the docks of Stone Toss and supporting. Um, oh yeah, that sort of thing. And said, "This is a quote, by the way, verbatim. Get get on the train to Zion, uh, or you know." face wow. the consequences basically and that would be oh yeah doxxed um i don't know if you have any thoughts about him uh specifically or if you waste too much time uh thinking about him but uh you know he's up in canada and has been talking shit for a while so i figured i, I would bring it up wow. just in case you wanted to i generally don't respect or consider the opinions of fat people anyway because i mean <laughs> how much can you put weighted stock into somebody who can't even control himself around a fridge you know like cake is your enemy dude you can't even beat sugar don't fucking come anywhere near me with your with your whining, first of all. And uh, yeah, maybe you should go on the Palestinian diet since you have such a hard time. Get on the train. Does it, you think this shit's funny, you fat tub of shit? You have any idea? Like, there are pictures. Of, like, did you ever see a six year old starve to death? That's what you're supporting. You ever see arms and limbs and, you know, hands and feet and eyeballs blown into every direction because they dropped a the fucking bomb on a bunch of innocent women and children hoping for food and aid relief while you were watching the fucking Super Bowl? And you have the audacity. To, to think you're on some kind of moral high ground, these people. They're, you're, you're directly, intentionally, enthusiastically sucking the dick of the world's prime evil, malevolent force, vampiring all of humanity to death so you can make a couple bucks to feed your fucking cheesecake diet. Cool. I yeah. I don't. I don't know who this person is really, but I, they seem like very respect, very respectable. It's they're definitely going places. I can tell. <laughs> Fucking. They're going down to the KFC. Uh, is where they're going. Actually, oh they have God. it delivered because <laughs> that would require too much movement. I think. How um, how low do you have to be to be, especially like to travel in these circles? Like you weren't born yesterday, and you're you're what? Like oh, you know what? The Israelis aren't so bad. Hey, uh, they oh, and he's Canadian, is he? Tell that to the family of Major Hess von Krudner, fatty. Because the Israelis murdered him in 2006 for reporting war crimes. They dropped uh, artillery shells on his head. They're accurate to within five meters. Several of these land on his head. And a laser-guided bomb, by the way. So accidentally, numerous times, they blew him to blew him smithereens, just like the USS Liberty and everything else they fucking do. I'm glad the money's good, though. Oh, I didn't realize I'd get that. I really don't like these people. You know. I don't either. Uh <laughs> Um, but you, you said it um, yourself there. It's like to run in these circles and to know what he knows and all of us know around here and then to, uh, you know, flip over to the – it's no way to say the pro-Zionist side for money, right? Uh, yeah. It's not like he had some Horrible. epiphany and, you know, now he loves right. Israel or whatever. Like, uh, it's for money. It's just it's, – yeah. it's like the activity of a whore, uh, basically, weak. right? Uh, it's weak. And, and yeah, yeah, I saw ahead. somebody in the chat here say, I'm, I'm shocked – yeah, Lisa, I'm shocked Worski doesn't like Jeremy. I've known Worski for a few years. I talked to him a few times. I was on, I think, this show with you with him years ago when, yeah, uh, during the D-Live were. days. Yeah. I never had a problem with that guy. I've never, you know. Yeah, and a, I'm, I and, singled and, out uh, PBB specifically because I, I don't know that right. Worski has said too much. But he has. I don't know. Fat boy has. I mean, Worski probably. Uh, Worski has said that, you know, he supported the Zion thing for sure. Uh, but, uh, yeah. That's very that's very disappointing. That's a sad, uh, yeah, it's, a sad, it's just, just spiraling right down to the bottom, huh? Oh, well. 
Well, it works for some people. Uh, but I guess uh, so. now let, let me ask you about uh, Poly- Polyev, right? Whatever. It doesn't mm. matter. Uh, like you said earlier, uh, I, I've seen some people in our chats and, and they're excited about him. And, you know, they're leading the polls, I think, about 20, 25 yeah, points. They are. And, They'll um, win. Yeah, I think they're going to win, right? It'd be hard to lose this one. Of course. That's <laughs> like, oh, do you think, Trump, do you think Trump's going to win? Oh, gee, I don't know. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be kind of hard to blow this one. It's even harder than yeah. Trump blowing it, right? Like, it'd be even crazier yeah. uh, because they've been leading for a long time and even though the election is not till next year i think uh it's uh, insurmountable. they're they're gonna lead. they're trying to they're, they're starting the process so they've introduced a, a non-confidence vote which they're gonna lose because there's basically three main parties and the other two are ones they're both they're basically openly communist now and they're in a coalition so they're just gonna vote down anything that they do but it's about the taxing and the carbon tax which ultimately you know it sucks but it's like a brick in the wall of a hundred thousand bricks we have to deal with and they're kind of act like this is the real big problem so we have to tear the government down and have an election. But they're going to say, oh, look, see, they'd rather bankrupt you and things are going to get worse and we're eventually going to get to an election. But they're st- they've started the uh, they're starting the process. Oh, somebody said it failed today. Yeah, of course, not expected. But now they now that's given them propaganda to say, oh, look, they don't want you to have relief. They want you to be broken poor forever. And they're making it about money, the most obvious issue and they're appealing to the lowest IQ voter like, like they always do. And, uh, you know, they're, they're going to win, but uh, nothing's going to change, unfortunately. Oh, and I, I got a message, and I, I forgot about this. Okay, so that that is true. We uncovered this recently. It's back to the last topic, and I, I didn't want to make it too much about that. That's why I kind of oh, save, so save it to the, towards the end of this. But um, I like throwing uppercuts. It's fine. Yeah, well, Worski and PPP both uh, have gotten the, the vaccine, but they lied to their audience about getting it. Uh, oh. And uh, Worski himself personally outed uh, within the past week week on this show where he had gotten the vaccine and this woman he was talking to in the UK, he was trying to cancer survivor actually uh, was trying to get her to get the vaccine so she could travel easier. And she refused to get it. Uh, and he, the, the point is he lied to his audience and said he didn't get the vaccine and publicly, you know, said he didn't, and he didn't, uh, but he did. Uh, and so wow. what's your vaccine says? I personally didn't take the vaccine. Uh, <laughs> and if I did, I would just tell people uh, that I yeah. did, but um yeah. I didn't. It was easy not to because I was self-employed by then anyway. Well, so, they I mean, were too. To... That's what I'm saying. They're self-employed right. too. Right. Anyway, go ahead. Well, yeah. it's well, it would be a travel issue, I suppose, to some extent. But I mean, I tried not to be too like tough guy about it because I didn't have like a family to support. And I'm working at a hospital or, or whatever. And yeah, um, I really I did think, though, like you, you know, it's it's the stakes are so high. You don't know what this is going to do. And if you knew what I knew about these people, you wouldn't you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't take it. It's, it's just there's too much risk. It's too insane. And uh, like, oh, but I need my job, my kids. Well, yeah, but if you're dead, though, you know, it's not really going to matter. Uh, but so a lot of people were, were shoveled into this. But I was I was doing this at that point. I was looking at doing military contracting when this first started because I hadn't made any money doing this at the time when I was doing that. And I was just kind of it was fun, though. And I enjoyed it. And I'm, you know, still enjoying it a lot of the time. But, um, yeah. So, no, I know I never did. And I, I've been trying to encourage people not to the whole time because I'm like, listen, you can always get a new job. You can always but you can't get a new body. You can't get new eyes or a new heart or whatever could happen. And you're starting to, people were, I was in one of these shops uh, at the time in, in a, like a Walmart. Uh, I can't remember exactly. It, it might've been a Walmart, but they had a pharmacy in there. And like a lot of places, they were doing it right there in the store. I watched a woman just face plant right there in the, in the waiting area. Like, yeah, they make you wait 15 or half an hour or whatever it was to see. And she just went right down in the chair, boom, right on the floor. She died. Ambulances came and you know, whatever. And people just looked at her and stayed in the line. <laughs> like, Bro, how do you? Oh my God! There's never been anything more. I mean, this is nakedly, openly the most obvious, you know, crime I think in human history. This was shoved on people, totally unnecessary. For oh, it's a flu virus. You might get sick for a day. Like who cares? I'm in my 30s. I'm in great shape. I don't need this. Maybe if you're 87 years old, and even then, I'd be like, I'll be dead soon anyway. I hope it kills me, right? Um, and children weren't even being affected by it at all. So it was like, this is all just a money. This is a scheme, guys. This is obvious to get this, uh, get, you know, products, make money. And they made trillions of dollars. Sure. And that's the best case scenario. I'm not even people like, oh, actually, fertility's down 88%, by the way, guys. You ever see the movie Children of Men? Maybe watch that and get back to me of how you maybe think of any some takeaways. Uh, it's a soft genocide, maybe. You know, it, it's one thing to just execute people that would be kind of on the nose. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if in two generations, everyone's infertile, well, well, you know, by the time you figure it out, it's way too late. So I don't know to, to play games with that and, you know, worry about yourself at the expense of other people. Like, you know, it sounds like these guys should be politicians. 
Yeah, well, they're they're on the right track, I guess. <laughs> you taking the wow. sinus money? Uh, the, Nasty. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sick. I ever like. I ever thought anything good of these guys. To be honest, I ugh. Whoops. <laughs> well, I have my own regrets there too, as regards to Worski. But uh, well, is, but isn't yeah. that ironic? They were they were saying, you know, you're the scumbag, right? Yeah, they say that yeah, quite that's, often. That's, um, that's certainly shaken out in a totally different way. <laughs> but I I personally didn't take the vax because, like you said, I was self employed. I had no reason to. I do give some leeway to yeah. some people felt like they had to for their job or whatever. Yeah. Although I agree with I, you, you can always get a new job. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I feel re- like they're victims. Right, I, I feel yeah. like they're, they were. I don't yeah. throw shade on everybody. Now you know a live streamer, podcaster who took it just so they could you know travel or whatever. Yeah. To me, that's cuckery, uh, especially yeah. lying about it. I mean, that's just hypocrisy on top of that. Um, But I didn't take it because of spite at first, because my mother uh, had a brain injury uh, when she went to Mm. to the hospital. She fell and hit her head, and she ended up dying months later. But it was a protracted process. And I'll just explain this quickly because I'm getting Mm. to something. Uh, So it was a protracted process, and she went from hospital to secondary care to hospice care. And I – Didn't want her to leave the hospital because she was actually improving there a little bit. Anyway, a long battle Mm. with Medicaid, and, you know, you're always going to lose that, and I did. Um, But when she went to the hospice care, there was a CDC uh, mandate that you couldn't visit. Whether you had the vaccine or not didn't matter. Um, It it was just 10 days waiting period before you could visit your loved one uh, in the hospice care or in an old folks' home or or what have you, uh, either one of those, um, because they – blamed a spike early on in the pandemic, quote unquote, on not enough, you know, strict procedures on that. So I wasn't able to see my mother when she passed away. She actually died on the 10th day and I was going to get to visit her the next day. She died alone. Uh, well, I mean, there were some people there, right. But not her loved right. ones. Right. Uh, and so she died alone and yeah. I decided not to take the vaccine just out of spite. Right. Like I'm like, okay, I'm never yeah. taking this fucking shit from this fucking government. Fuck them and what they did to me That's- and everybody else. Um, Go ahead, and I'll I'll let you chime in, but I I was just going to say, um, I feel like this has been, like, a collective, um, like, damage to the body politic. Like, you know know what I mean? Like, a collective um, trauma that uh, is never going to go away for a lot of people. And there's worse stories than mine, by the way. I'm not trying to make mine tops. There's there's a lot of terrible, horrible stories out there about people who didn't get to see their loved ones die or attend funerals and stuff like that. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, we've had I've, I've, a number of people who couldn't go to their funerals of their loved ones, couldn't see their, you know, they had to die alone behind yeah. a plastic sheet with some nurse who doesn't give a shit about them. And it's just, that is that is so in, in, in <laughs> like, uh, I don't know if the words exist for how offensive and insulting that is. Um, it, and they treat it like it's just another thing that happens. That's the end of someone's life. That's maybe one of the most important days is the last one. Yeah. And I've, I mean, I've, you know, thought about this a lot because I was exposed to extreme violence at 20 years old where, you know, machine gunning people back and forth in grape fields and throwing bombs and body parts are flying around. So I'm kind of desensitized, but you, you think about it a lot. And uh, I remember, th- I, I think about this sometimes and, you know, you get to a point like, what, what, what would be worse? Would you rather die alone or with somebody, with people that, you know, you, your loved ones and family, like it's going to be scary regardless. And I think it would definitely be better to have, you know, ideally you're an old man and your children are there and your grandchildren and you're, you know, um, to kind of see you off and, you know, kind of like everything's going to be okay. It's, sorry, I'm getting. <clears throat> and they took that from people. They made them die alone and scared with their family members outside. Like, who the fuck are you to say that they have to stand out? It, it just, it's, un, it's unspeakably awful. And these people should be, should be put in prison for the rest of their lives. I couldn't agree more, and the fact that there hasn't been some type of I, – I don't know. It's its just, a, like I said, a Not yet. trauma. Uh, and yeah. the fact that they've gotten away with it uh, is just unbelievable. Uh, and I, and I for th- now. For now. I was going to say, yeah, there's still time. There's still time as long as, uh, as, long as we're still breathing. Uh, <laughs> While I live and breathe. <laughs> yeah, I was going to yeah. say, there's still plenty of time. Um, but, uh, you know, like I said, I didn't take it out of spite at first, but that was kind of before all the – uh, you know, stuff had come out about how evil, the, you know, how fucked up the vaccine could fuck up your health, right? Like, yeah. but at first it was just, you know, fuck you, I'm not taking this because of, because of yeah. that. And I think, um, it it awoke a, a lot of people just in general against uh how evil uh these governments are. I mean, I don't know another yeah. word for it other than evil. Uh, yeah. and so I think we're I still agree. seeing that, uh, still seeing that play out now. Um. Let me let me look in chat here. We have over 800 people live here uh, on Rumble nope. and a bunch of people on Kick as well. Um, who and, and I'm gonna finish it off next 15 minutes probably uh, with some general questions. Um, 
who have been some of your inspirations uh, during your uh, time in the spotlight? Uh, and you truly have been in the spotlight. Spotlight, like we were playing this clip before you came on. It's the CBC, uh, you know, personalized hit piece on you. Like not many people, uh, even me. I had a Wall Street Journal article, a couple of things, but nothing like that, right? Like NBC News didn't yeah. put out <laughs> Ethan a, Rob, a, get him off the air, right? Uh, type yeah. shit. Uh, and so it's another level uh, when it goes yeah. up to there. Uh, who, who've been some of your inspirations uh, as you've yeah. um, gone along in the business? I'm a I'm a medium sized fish in a very small mud puddle. <laughs> it's Canada, right? There's not a, there's not a lot to you know, so it doesn't take much to become a target of someone's yeah. attention out here. Really, um, that's a good question. I've never really thought of that. Um, a lot of uh, maybe some soldiers I knew, some guys I know. My my grandfather for sure. He's passed away years ago, and I always wonder like what he would have thought of this and what he would have done. He's a very strong guy, very community. Like he would have given the shirt off his back for just somebody that needed it. He was just that old, like great guy, you know? Um, and he lived his whole life like that. And I always really admired him for the strength that he had to do these things and endure bullshit for other people. And I was just mystified by it my whole life. And I always kind of, you know, draw strength from those people. And some of the, some of the soldiers I learned from when I, when I first joined the military, some of the sergeants I had, my own father who just worked tirelessly his whole life at nonsense, just so we had to, you know, we had what we had and, and it's just, um, you know, it's life. It, it doesn't matter what it is you're doing, if you're going to try and do it and do it well and, and do it a, to a high level, it's going to suck and it's going to get hard. And if you don't, if you don't have that internal constitution to just kind of, you know, rock up and, and power through when it gets hard, um, you're not going to make it. You're not going to get very far. And, uh, these guys all did and they were all capable of it. And so if I can take any pieces of them or part of, part of them with me to do it, if they can do it, I can do it. Um, so yeah, a lot of personal stuff, really. No, nothing really, you know, famous or any right. anybody in particular. But yeah, there's there's been some some people. Yeah, my yeah my parents, my family, my my a lot of my friends and supporters. It's it's crazy. Like uh, when I was in jail, I had um, letters from all over the world. I had a guy from Greece, somebody from Russia. There was people New Jersey, like Texas, Oklahoma, all over Canada, right? Um, just expressing how it, not necessarily even me, but just the, the fact that this group of people exists. That when it didn't like to lean on and talk to and, and and just to just to share and commiserate like how crazy everything is, um, having that kind of knowledge that 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 peer group and tribe tribal kind of connection exists like there are other there are people like me out there. I'm not a freak. I'm not a weird. You know, I'm totally alone and I could die tomorrow. No one would ever care. No, there's there's quite a few of us actually. And it's been a great benefit to them, and they just wanted to express that. And I just. Uh, you know, like if I'm going to sit here in prison and I knew I wasn't going to be in there forever. I was worried. It could have been a year though. It could have been a while because the trial wouldn't have been until, and if I don't get bail and so on, it's a whole shit show. But I was like, uh, in the grand scheme of things, like what, what is a year sitting in the box here? You know, and the trade is, you know, all these people get to have, you know, collectively, a li it's a little bit easier for this many of them. Like if I, I will make that trade. That's okay. That's okay to me. Um, so you just take stock of what you're doing. If you really believe in what you're doing, it's, it becomes a lot easier. But if you're somebody that's doing it for money, you're doing it for attention, you're doing it for bullshit, thin bullshit reasons, that shit's going to get fucking disintegrated. When you get thrown in the fire, you think that's going to save you? No, it's not. It's gotta be, it's gotta be real. That passion and your, your love for your people and, and what you're doing, what you believe in has to be real or it's going to get melted like everything else. Now, before I ask you about uh, some of your most rewarding moments uh, throughout your career, uh, let me ask you about um, some of your toughest moments. Have there ever been any, by the way, we're the 15th biggest stream on rumble, uh, right now. I'm, I'm being told, uh, even though they, oh. even though they shadow ban me basically on rumble, I won't talk too much yeah. shit about them. Me, but me too. They I think they let me though. Me. I, I'm going to be real. They do. They say they don't, but they do. They never yeah. let me on the live yeah. streaming. Page. They don't advertise me on the sign out front, no, but they, they let don't. me have a booth in the that's back. That's right. So, so I can't, that. that's me too. I don't talk too much trash about it, but they do shadow. Well, you know, me. Yeah. you know what we are. It's like when we go to the video store, you go to block, Busters or maybe the old ones back in the day like you don't see any of the adult movies on the right. front but there's a room in the back and there's a curtain and it's you know we just don't talk about it but we let that's right it's it, and i and i thank them for that that's why i don't talk too yes. much trash about it but i'm being honest yes. they do they do yes. shut up and good to know i'm in good yes. company uh with yeah. that uh but yeah they do but anyway we're still here and i just wanted to point that out but have there ever been any moments i know i'm getting you know uh yeah, larry yeah. king type questions here but uh oh, you know i i, I like to to ask these sorts of things. Uh, to, no, I don't to get, get to a, do this often. Yeah, so to get a to, to let people get a feel of the of the guests, get a feel of the man. Um, sure. Have there ever been any moments uh, where you're like, man, I sh I shouldn't have done this. Uh, this is this oh yeah, is too much. And if yeah. so, like, could you name a couple of those times? 
Yeah, it, that definitely happens. Not not so much lately, and probably not in the last maybe year right. at nearly as much. Um, uh, I think it's just a human thing. It's just a lot of the time. It's like you. Uh, well, I tried to tell you, if you're healthy, like so. So this kind of thing is not physically laborious. Like it's not like it. You know, people are like, well, you're in the special forces. That should have been. Fo-. Yeah, well, that's physically very difficult, and and can be mentally and emotionally challenging at times. If you're deployed, you're doing you know this that or whatever. But generally, it's physically a hard job. But not. This is a whole. This is a different kind of difficulty. This is like a spiritual kind of pain and struggle and suffering and and, and mental and and. Uh, there's a different degree to that. So, so a different uh, kind of strength is required. You have to be very healthy and strong to withstand the kind of shit that you're going to subject yourself to. Like, like I found the hard way when I went to do these things in the military, I wasn't I was like, Oh, I can run 10 K in a decent time. I can do 40 pushups. I'm probably in pretty good shape. I have no idea. You basically need to be a professional athlete. I crawled over the finish line. You know, I was like, okay, I, I have some work to do, you know? And in this way, this kind of fighting is, is different. So the healthier you are and the more well adjusted you are i think it's easier to withstand these things so like you know taking care of yourself and getting outside and moving your body and eating so when you get to these points where you're like miserable and just yeah you start to doom spiral you know my girlfriend called you're doom spiraling i go you're right i am i don't know why i do this it's just and i go when when's the last time i got enough sleep what when's the last time i ate like a good meal when's the last time i've been to the gym did i even drink enough water today oftentimes like three or four or all of those apply and i'm like that's why i feel like shit because uh you forget about these things and you're just you've let yourself get some sleep get some good food into you take a little break and you'll be fine in a couple of days you just don't let it uh but you gotta you gotta keep on top of that kind of maintenance i find like i always kind of bounce back you know you get a bad day or a couple days you take a week off whatever but you know these kinds of things are normal i think and these kind of high stress uh you know, high activity, a lot, a lot is going on. A lot of things are happening. A lot, it's a lot to worry about. Um, so I think that's important to do. And, uh, that's certainly been, been helpful. Um, jail, there were some moments you know, <laughs> sitting in solitary and you're like, God, damn. especially before I had a lawyer, I didn't have any, I was totally, you know, at that, there was a, a good couple of weeks where I was like, this is not good. Um, cause the, the lawyers available were just scum. They were just giving me, you know, fuck off prices. It's like, yeah, give me 80 grand and I'll do a bail hearing. A fucking bail hearing should be like 5,000 at the most. And he's like, so they're, you know, taking me for a ride. The guy I did have, when I went in there, I just picked him up off the street. He totally flipped on me. He didn't even try to fight back. I was like, I, in the courtroom, I brand bought him over the thing. I was like, what the fuck are you doing? And he just goes like this. And he goes back and sits down. And I was like, oh, you know, I was, uh, so there was some, and you know, I, these guys were trying to kill me in there. I had to fight, I had to fight a couple of times and it, you know, it's just, and your kids are wondering where you're at. Like, yeah, it's, it's hard, man. It's, there's some rough uh, moments. And this was in the, in the, the time frame where we had uh, guys were in jail for a long time. Like Pat King is another character up here. He was again, just a regular guy saying some things. Not everybody likes what he's saying, but he, and he was in jail for like eight or nine months on a mischief charge. And then you've got uh, this other what, grandmother, Tamara Lee, she's in jail for months. And it, like, it was crazy, dude. So I'm like, I could be in here a while because this is politically charged and this, and no one believes you either. I'm talking, this is before I had the lawyers, before I had hate gate, before I had anything. And I'm saying, listen, this is a move. This is, they're lying. This isn't true. And then you just sound insane. You're like, sure, they are crazy, man. I'm, I'm innocent. You got to believe me. And there was <laughs> one of the guys on the range when I, when I'm first clearing in, this big Indian guy, like they're all Indians in there, mostly native america not not the indian, indian. Right. <laughs> yeah right and he's like uh sweeping the thing right and i had just gotten denied bail i go in he like hands me my supper and i was like thanks man or whatever and he goes hey I'm like why well, i got up go back to the, the window and he's like now you're an indian <laughs> and so I was like, 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 okay okay i see no you're an indian no <laughs> was like, skip was that guy's name skip he said yeah so there was some bad ones there but you know you just it's the same as in, in anything else. If it gets dark and horrible, like there's two things like, okay, it can't get much worse. You know, like what realistically could happen. Um, you can either continue and try to fight your way out of this, or you could just give up and die. There's really, which, which do you want to do? Well, one of those is you, you never are going to win. If you surrender you, the, any chance, even if you have a one, if you have a 1% chance of success, it's not quitting. Quitting is zero. So if you continue and fight, maybe maybe you pull a rabbit out of your hat and you can, you know, pull something off. So you just laser in, focus in on that. You have to be one of these, you just have to refuse to die. You have to be an incredibly, <laughs> I joke about like, I'm, I'm Scottish mostly. My grandmother's from Denmark. So I've like, I had no chance. I'm like made of spite. <laughs> I have Viking and Highland Scottish ancestors. I'm just looking for things to fuck with all the time and refuse to die, I guess. It would be worse. There might, if I'm any Irish at all, it's going to be even worse. So I don't know, but. Yeah, you just uh, you have to think of it in those terms. Like it's a, everything in life is a fight. Everything's a struggle, and every day, um, whether you're you know this big fat pea guy who just can't stop eating, like <laughs> every day you go to pick up that cupcake, that's a fight you lost. 
every time you sleep in. That's another fight you lost. Were you going to go to the gym today? Nah, I'm not going to. I'm lazy. You lose again. Every one of these things is, is a little mini internal struggle that you've chosen to lose or not lose. And uh, if you just, that's really all we can do. And, you know, if you believe in fate or not, it is what it is, you know. But as long as you leave everything out there or you, or you don't leave anything on the table, you expend. You do, I did everything I could. I tried as hard as I can. I went as far as I could go. And, uh, and that's it. Um, and I credit the military a lot for a lot of this kind of mental toughening that I went through and these, uh, these special forces selections and stuff. I remember there was a point where I was so exhausted and I wasn't in great shape. I was in okay shape, but I wasn't in the shape I needed to be. So I'd suffered more than I needed to. And I'm trying to keep up with these guys. And I'm just like, I'd never been pushed this hard in my life. I've never been this tired. Everything hurt so bad. And I thought I'm going to, I'm probably, I'm going to have to quit. I'm not going to make it. And I just, I couldn't bear the shame of it. I couldn't bear to, you know, just to these guys to see me leave and get on the truck and go home. Like I couldn't do it. So I was like, you know, it's worse. I felt like at the time, almost delusional. I had not slept in a couple of days and I'm just like, I'll die instead. Fine. I'll death it is. So I was like, I'm just going to run until I'm assuming I'll black out or my legs will snap or, you know, something will fail because I, I felt like that was close. So I was like, I'll just go until then because that's a more honorable way to go out. I'll go out on a stretcher unconscious and then I don't have to feel shame. I'll just, but, and then, and then eventually, you know, nine hours later it was over and I'm standing there like, holy fuck, I'm alive. I did it. Huh? So you just, you go, it's whether it kills me or yeah. we're fucking going until I'm dead and, uh, either you'll be dead or you'll win. So I've just tried to apply that to everything else I do. And I try to, you know, encourage people to adopt that as well, because you can't, nobody that gives up ever wins anything ever. So. Yeah, and most of the life struggles is really in the mind. Uh, right? Yep. Uh, All of and them. you know there can be physical struggles. Obviously, that was tough, but it was your yeah. mind. It was the it was the mind that carried you over the finish line. Uh, and that's yep. the, that's the internal battle with everything. Like you said, with the cupcake, uh, if you're drinking too yeah, much, uh, you yep. know any of that, it, it's it's in the mind. Yeah. I just uh, put a video out about that on Instagram because a few people asking me though they've got friends and stuff. They're like drinking a lot. And they don't know how to start. And it's like, yeah, you you have to understand that that's a fight you're in, and it's not even entirely like. Not to, not to say it's not your fault, right? It's like, oh, it's not even your fault. It was, you know, it's the booze fault. Like, well, it is kind of your fault, but it also kind of isn't. Like, you understand right. we're in a world that preys upon people. It wants you to be drunk all the time. It wants you to consume these products. It wants you to stay home and eat trash. Everything that's monetized, every vice imaginable has been monetized to the moon. Guess who? And is just shoved in your face everywhere. And, and you're made to live this slave-like existence. And the only solace you can find is offered in these, in these toxic pro booze and drugs and you know fast food and endless free porn and video games. None of it's good for you, but all of it's available. Um, so it's like you can't fault people too bad. For I mean, it's designed to ensnare them and, and destroy them and, and grind them into nothing. That's the whole point of it. Um, but I think if alert, alerting people to that, and I kind of came to this through, I was talking about uh, suicide one year because we lose a lot of guys in the veteran community. And sure. This kind, this was a big benefit to me back in the day, like years and years ago when I was feeling this way is, is like, you know, metaphorically or physically, um, you may be beating yourself up or you literally have a gun in your mouth, whichever it is, like you're pointing it at the wrong thing. You turn it around because there's somebody and there's things out there. It's not my imagination. Like you're being, uh, attacked essentially. Like this is, you're being made, like, you know, like there's a fight to be had and you're in it. Like you're, do you want to be a victim or do you want to, you know, re-engage and, and, you know, Throw it back the throw it back the other way. That's a lot more of a positive way to live. It's maybe not ideal, but it's like hate yourself and want to die, or hate them and want to you know be so healthy and indestructible that no matter what they throw at you, it just doesn't work, and they have to end up being frustrated. And in, I I would love to be a fly on the wall in some of these offices and some of these meetings when you know we printed all these articles and it's not stopping them. We put them in jail. That's not stopping them. We canceled their bank accounts and they still got lawyers. And they go yeah, keep going. You know, because it's a battle of the wills and it's like ours must triumph over theirs and theirs is very small and weak. With all their, everything they have, all of the media, all of the edge, everything, the police, the, the God, everything, every institution of any value is ideologically captured and used and just focused like the eye of Sauron on anybody that would cross it. And even despite that, there's still, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like paving concrete over a field. The blades of grass just keep coming up eventually over time anyway. You can never win. It's like the will of nature itself versus these petty small pathetic little tyrant they they care about money and you know just stupid shitty consumerist materialistic things that ultimately go nowhere and it's you know on a long enough timeline you know if, we, if ours refuses to die they'll they will eventually run out of steam under the weight of people that will just die before they give up great answer by the way i see disfigured corpse says 
I vamos Ralph uh, there in the chat. Well, shout out to my Mexican location. Uh, Daniel Larson Stan says salute Ralph a coin rising. I appreciate that. Also hit like. I'm being told we're close to 200 likes. Oh, I didn't even hit like. Yes, can we get <laughs> over 200? I forget. Yeah, <laughs> you got to uh, remind. Yeah, yeah, we gotta actually like hit those likes. We can get over 200 likes. I think. Uh, now I asked you that uh, about some of your uh, times you might have had some doubts uh, about things. Yeah. Uh, and this might be my last question, and then I'll let you uh, sure. talk a little bit on your own. Um, but what have been some of your most rewarding moments, uh, rewarding mm. uh, memories uh, from yeah. all this? And it could be something small. You know, sometimes people tell me, you know, Ralph, I'll be going through a hard time, right? And somebody might see it on air, and yep. I'll say, keep your head up. You know, I was listening to your show when my kids were born. Or it got yeah. me through my father dying. You know, this was the only laugh yeah, I man. had in my, in my life at that time, yeah, right? Uh, and so that's the types of things that, that meant a lot to me. And I don't think about that so sort of stuff day to day because I'm just doing my show. Yeah. You know, it's, it's my job. And yeah. uh, when you hear that type of stuff, it, it's touching. But what about for, for you? Yeah. I mean, I've had a lot of that similarly too. And it, it just, it doesn't hit a lot of the time because I feel like I don't deserve it. You know, it feels in, yeah. not insincere, but it's it. like, sure. And they're like, oh man, like you guys helped me from, you know, you stopped me from this and that. It could have been so much. And I'm like, sure it did. You know, not really like maybe a little, but it was all you, you did all that. So it's hard to, to feel that way. It's just, I think I'm just made that way. But you know, but, but there is, yeah. And I've had like all, nearly all the stuff I have, people have sent me all these things. Like I got a giant, you know, steel medieval war helmet. <laughs> the other you know, like this lamp over here, handmade stuff. I got all kinds of crazy, great stuff and letters from people. And it's just the outpouring of support, but it really, um, you know, I didn't even, one of the things that I always thought that, you know, I'm not going to ask for help. I'm not, I don't try, I, I don't ask for money. Everything's free. Like the shows are free. Everything. If you want to, it's fine. Um, and even when I got arrested in jails and stuff, I'm not going to, but my friends banded together and um and they uh oh. i couldn't go to the fundraiser because i wasn't allowed to leave the province i was on house arrest for a year i couldn't go i was on a curfew and all this other crazy nonsense restrictions because i was so dangerous right and uh they had this fundraiser down in, in southern ontario and like hundreds of people came and they, an insane amount of money they pulled together like i don't know probably 100k over a couple of different um of, of venues and and that allowed me to, and i didn't have to i didn't even ask i didn't say anything they just did it so i was like it, it was very humbling to think that that, that that many people felt it was necessary or worth it to help me of all people. So I just, that was, that was pretty incredible. And, and other things like, uh, you know, these gatherings we had and people got together, like the first one we had in Saskatchewan that I was, I heard you were just, I was describing on the, you know, the, the, the interrogation yeah. <laughs> right out there to see people just, you know, it's like, I know I had a hand in making this happen and I'm just satisfied that I was able to bring something good to people that have had nothing but shit thrown at them for so long. And uh, probably the best one lately, I literally, I don't normally, I'm hard to get excited. It might be hard to, about like anything good. Like I'll get really animated about terrible things and be angry a lot because I'm just, built, I'm so dead. I have to fucking cruise my mind. I have to, I guess. But uh, I was in court myself with Morgan, uh, you know, one of the many, many court days we had. And after we'd, uh, um, well, well, I should back up a little bit. One of these guys, and I, I hope I'm not, you know, embarrassing him or putting her on the spot, but it's just a, I thought it was a, it was a beautiful thing that happened. And um, he called me from jail and he was like, I, you know, I don't know if I'm going to make it in here because I'd have no hope at all. And I, he was just like, I just want to say thanks for everything you guys tried to do. And it was almost, it felt like a goodbye. Yeah. And I was just like, I hung up the phone and uh, Morgan was sitting next to me on the bed and I was just like, this can't, this can't happen. <clears throat> so I called my lawyer and I said, who do you know? Who's the guy? If I needed to get this, who, who do I get? And he's like, I, this guy. He could do it. It's going to be expensive, though. So I was like, I'll call him. I'll see what he says. And he's like, he's an excellent lawyer. He's one of the best in the country. He's like, I can do it. I can get this done. But because of the the, the late stage in the proceedings we'd gotten to, um, you know, it's got to happen fast because there's pretrial hearings and stuff coming up. And then by that point, you've missed all your opportunities to create a defense and bring in, you know, evidence excluded or included and all this kind of stuff. So he's like, yeah, I'll do it. But I'm going to need, uh, I'm going to need about uh, $200,000 in about 10 days. I was like, no problem. Got it. I just pretended I was like a rich guy. <laughs> you know, I was with him. Just totally like, yeah, that won't be an issue. Yeah, I'll get that to you. No problem. I hung up the phone. I started sweating immediately. Like, oh, <laughs> I called, called the fellas and, you know, Derek and, and Alex and the rest of the guys. Like, okay, so we're going to do some fundraising now. And uh, within six days, four days, maybe, the community just was like, here you go. And we had it. All right. You know, and I, we got it over to the lawyer and get him on retainer, right? That was just the first piece. I think it ended up, it's, we still owe him money, I think. Um, Got with the first piece and got him on board and um, gave the guy some hope again that like a professional is coming now. Like instead of getting ripped off by these shitty two-bit lawyers and these people like 
you know, it was just a circus. Like there was no adults in the room looking out for these guys at all. And we went and, and found one and sent him in there on a, on a, on a rocket. And, uh, I think a month later he had him out of prison and he'd been in there for almost two years Jeez. away from his girls, away from his kids, his life destroyed. He's being slandered and you know, whatever. Right. And, um, I heard in court, uh, I was in court and they kind of hinted like something was afoot that day, that morning. I was like, okay, I see. And I got a text in court that he was free and they sent me a picture of him with his kids. And I was just like, I fucking, it was, in, it was on a break. So there's nobody really in the room, but I just, uh, fist pumped. Oh, sorry. I got a call coming from somewhere. Shoot. Sorry. Yeah. I stood up and I was like, fucking, you know, people were like, what's happening? You know, and I couldn't really say anything cause it wasn't public yet, but that's awesome. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. That was, that was, that was pretty great. That was something like we able to, to bring that to, you know, bring some, bring something, some relief to somebody somewhere. That was a great time and a great, so I'm, I'm proud. Of, I'm proud of not me, but th that, that everyone pitched in and people gave a lot of money, like thousands of dollars in some cases. And some people like, uh, it's like, I don't have any money. I can't like, I, but I can, I can make something. And they're like knitting like quilts and shirts and d building things and create and, and selling them and using that money. To, it was just a full court press from all over the place. And, uh, I had other lawyers calling me being like, Oh, can I get in on this? And all that. Oh, now that we got money all of a sudden, everybody <laughs> wants to help. Uh -huh, I don't think so. So I was doing a lot of, you know, screening a lot of calls that week and yeah, but, uh, it was, it was nice. And it was nice to, a nice flex against our enemies, you know, that like, you think you can, you know, do this kind of shit to us. We're not going to fight back. You're wrong. And that's a great story. Whenever you, and of course, you know, you're doing a lot of activism. I, I could run a talk show, uh, but here and there, uh, things happen. I'll, I'll just mention this since there's a lot of people here. Uh, tomorrow we're having Base Faith TV on, and he was on a couple weeks ago, and he had gotten, f um, not fired, but expelled uh, from his law school uh, because he put up It's Okay to Be White Flyers. And we had him right. on the show a couple weeks ago, and he just asked if he could come on. It wasn't even me who, who you know, asked him on. I said, yeah, sure. You have an sure. interesting story, and I think people would like to hear it. And he came on, and at the end of the interview, I said, well, you know, do you have a gifts and go or some type of fun, somebody? And he didn't have one. And I was like, damn, Look. I was kind of shocked. I was like, oh, you don't have anything set up? Well, somebody, yeah. um, I don't know if it was somebody from VDare watching the show live, uh, but VDare got a hold of the story and ended up writing an article and linking to the interview and they had a Gibson go and it raised thousands of dollars uh for him nice. uh after we'd yeah. had him on the show and peter brimlow you may know peter brimlow a uh, really nice guy uh, name rings a bell he runs vdare anyway uh and he's been <laughs> around for a while if you don't know him you should uh maybe i can send you that contact actually but uh he's, okay. a, he's a really nice guy and uh he, he sent me an email and said you know you did a really good interview really good thing there uh and so i don't get as much opportunity as you because i'm kind of you know it's a talk mm -hmm. show i'm entertaining you know you're doing direct yeah. activism type stuff and I'm, I'm a little bit removed from it but every once in a while uh when you can do something like that even unintentionally uh it makes you feel really good so i really yeah. uh, i really thought your story it's, was way cooler but but, but i mean yeah, <laughs> no it's, it's but, it all counts man but, uh, there's another yeah. one it reminded me of another one similar kind of thing like not a huge deal it's not yeah. like you know stop the presses kind of thing but just these these acts and these gestures it it uh, it does something to you um the act of you know doing something for other people when there's nothing yeah. in it for you at all it it just it, it 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 does make you more powerful in some sense i don't know how to describe it but it, it almost kind of you know upgrades your faculties in a yes. way that now you're you're more spiritually difficult to contend with as far as the enemy is concerned and we had a guy this is just a funny story kind of a sweet story but kind of a funny story and there was a, a kid on the D Live days years ago, and his uh, mom was a fan, and she was watching. And like uh, a chat, a chatter had popped up in there. His name was Rage Fan Ten, and uh, he was talking to one of the guys, Quick Dub, is one of one of my buddies there. He was, you know, helping me a lot at the time. He's still around. It's a great guy, and uh, he's he's like talking to this this person, and he's like, "Yeah, I'm a ten year old." <laughs> he's like, "What? You're ten? You're a ten year old?" And his mom is watching the show in the other room. She runs into the bedroom, and there's the kid with the laptop. <laughs> <laughs> He's <laughs> like, ah, what are you doing? So we laughed about that for years. Like, remember that time there was a 10 year old kid? He's like, right, I swear too much. This isn't for kids. I shouldn't be, you know, but there are out there. There's probably a seven year old watching me somewhere right now that shouldn't be. And um, he was in a really bad uh, accident and uh, rolled an ATV and, and nearly died and um, was really messed up. And his father had just passed away recently, right before that. And his mom had reached out and was just like, I think she wanted me to like um, just write him a letter or something. If that was, yeah. you know, because it would make him feel better or something. And I was like, write him a letter. We got, I think we got him ten grand. We got them ten thousand dollars before Christmas. Wow. And you know, me and Morgan went and visited him in the hospital. And you know, I, you know, he's texting me on the phone. I keep in touch with him. He's a little bit older now. I think he's fifteen or sixteen now at this point. But yeah, he's recovered and he's on his feet and living his life and stuff. So stuff like that is is really what I look back on and and go like, 
because none of that would be possible. If, if I had stopped and I had quit years ago in 2020, 2021, I would never have been able to get that kid 10 grand because I'm not doing this. I don't have the audience. Where? Why? How? They wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't, wouldn't happen. I wouldn't be able to do any of the things I do um, if it wasn't for that. So th those are the kind of, you know, little, you know, infinity stones that you collect that right. you really, you know, hang And it boosts that's, yourself that's, up. Like I, like I said, that yeah. day I got that message, you know, about what had happened. I, I was kind of feeling down that day, honestly. And then I got that and I was like, hey, man, you know what? Uh you can really yeah. do some good things with the with the position you yeah. have here. Uh, and, and gratitude is helpful. If people, if you yeah. remember, like the things that you have, that you should be, you should be grateful. For the things you have, you have your health. And anybody in your life that cares about anything, even just this, even just your fans. It's like not everybody gets this. Not everybody can have or do a lot of this. So it's like appreciating what you have makes you feel more content, and you you lose the greed, you lose the ego, you lose all that, and you become more centered in a in a healthy place where you can do do more fucking damage you know that's when you're in that's when you're locked in when you're really the best version of yourself then you're really then you're hitting home runs you know and that's that's what you, you want to try to be so gratitude and, and focusing on on those kind of positive outcomes and stuff and helping people all of this is just real it seems like it seems cliche especially the, the age we grew up like yeah. it was all degenerate necks and wrestling and drinking and partying and that stuff's lame and dumb and not cool no it is this is how you fight now it's like become ned flanders and you're a neo-nazi <laughs> you're fucking <laughs> the most dangerous guy in the world like i diddly diddly did it you know <laughs> and just yeah. I'm gonna sigly sigly sig Heil here if I don't <laughs> it's true it's true especially with what we yeah. grew up with yeah it's being degenerate and that's the cool yeah. thing and you know maybe yeah, I dabbled in I that a little I, bit but uh, yeah I but it's really not I did answer. crazy stuff. Yeah. I was doing drugs and everything like everybody else was doing I mean we've all most guys most guys yeah. that are you know that are have that kind of personality that are risk takers and, and like to, you know, speak up and get, yeah, you're probably also the type that dates motorcycle chicks and you know, <laughs> some of the things you shouldn't be doing, but you know, what are you going to do now? Let me give you a little bit of time. This has been one of my favorite interviews, uh, in a long time. Well, thanks, uh, and I'm not going to keep you. you all night cause you've been so generous with your time already. Um, first off, um, just any final thoughts you want to give, uh, anything we didn't cover, anything you wanted to say that you didn't get to say. I know you have your own show and stuff too, but anything you want uh, to say to everybody not tonight. here? Not tonight. Yeah. Oh, no, well, not tonight today, you don't so. have a show, but uh, yeah. anything you want to say that I didn't hit or just a final message. And then also, uh, a lot of your people are already here, but for people who don't know where to find you, tell people where to find you and, and how to stay in touch with you and watch your material, et cetera. I don't know. I think I kind of hit. I, I generally try to leave on a high note, on a positive note, and try to encourage people. I think that was basically a no, just so. relive for the last five minutes. Yeah, I was gonna say that was a pretty high watermark right there. Yeah, but uh, yeah, man. I, I mean, um, you know, we can't win if we don't try, and if we don't try, we've quit, and if we quit, we die. So, um, you know, that's uh, people always want to look to the look to the end and, and look to you know look, after somebody's already been successful or after somebody's already achieved or, or overcome something incredibly difficult. They they don't see the 10 or 20 years it took to get there and all the bullshit that happened in between and the houses that burned down and the dogs that got killed and the drug addiction, you know, all the, all this stuff, you forget about all that. You know, you, you forget about all that. You focus on just the, you know, the end product and people get demoralized. Like, why can't I just get there? It takes a lot, man. It's a whole bore to fight to get there. So, you know, um, we're under it for sure. Um, in North America and in Europe and, and all over the world, it's coming down on, on us all. And it's, uh, it seems quite bad, but, that's not really any different. It's it's been quite bad always when you look at it. Like imagine being an Irishman during the potato famine, or uh, you know a Georgian farmer during the Civil War. Like there is a million and one ways where it's dark days, you know. And people, you know, the, the ones that fought on and carried on, they managed to pull themselves out of it, and you know, created a next, you know, birthed another generation for the next, you know, to to carry on and keep going. And they had you know some good times, and then maybe it got dark again, and it's time to fight again, and we have to fight. That's just the process. That's life on Earth. There's never going to be a time where it just doesn't exist. And I think we got spoiled. We lived yeah. 80 yeah. years, basically struggle-free since the end of World War II. We just had got high on our own cakes and high chocolate cakes and high fives, and you know, everything's going to be like this forever. It's not, and it's you know, the bills come due. And uh, we got too soft and too decadent and too lazy and too tolerant for too long. And now we're going to pay the price. But it's not a price we can't pay. Um, we're paying for it, but we'll be able to. And uh, it's totally possible. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm sh I'm, it's totally, I can definitely see it. In 50 years from now, they'll be, they can look back and go, man, that would have been a crazy era to live through. And it came so close. It came so close to just everything falling apart. And right at the end, they, you know, turned it around. It's It's been done before. It's been done before in history and it, it can be done again. And if anybody's capable of doing it, it's the... Uh, 
the children, it's the grandchildren and the great grandchildren of, you know, think of all the people that had to suffer and die and struggle for just for us to get here. Every war and famine and, you know, natural disaster and wild animals and disease and everything else just for us to exist, everything they had to overcome uh, for us to be here. And that's where their direct descendants We're the same people, but that's that DNA. If anybody is made to, you know, take these people on and beat them, it's us. So, and if it doesn't work out and we all perish, Hey, we made a bang of it. You know, I'm not going out like a loser, you know, we ever see brave hearts you know, <laughs> if you gotta go down go down so hard they make movies about you with mel gibson in it, okay so it doesn't uh, get any better than that. i'm optimistic yeah i'm optimistic i think we can i think we can do some damage so if you're in canada uh come find us because we're the only ones that actually care pretty much everybody else is lying to you or self-interested uh you know narcissists RagingDistant.com is uh, my website you can find my social media stuff on there my uh channels that they're allowed to have me on and uh, I'm banned for life from mostly everything. Any of the normal platforms, Twitter won't allow me anymore and anything else. So uh, the Telegram for now is, is the best place to catch me. So you can go t.me slash Raging Dissident 2 or 3. Um, I don't know which one is more shadow banned than the other. It's hard to say. There's been some wonky stuff. But you know, Roman numerals, uh, 2 or 3. The links are on the website, uh, RagingDissident.com. Thanks a lot, Ralph. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. Like I said, I, I really hope people enjoyed this interview as much as I enjoyed conducting it. Conducting it, and I appreciate you uh, spending so much time uh, with us tonight. Uh, the raging distant, Jeremy McKenzie. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot, man. Appreciate it. All right. Stay healthy. You're looking good. I appreciate that too. Yeah, have a good one, sir. On the kill stream. All right. Thanks for watching this clip. This is Willow. Remember to like and subscribe.